Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I was like freaking out because I'm like, I don't have a Zoom ID. I was trying to get into Miss Johnson's. I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to no, be no, late. No, 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 Nobody no. emailed yeah. me. No, we Nobody good. called me. We're good. I posted yeah. in the discussions like, somebody please respond. I'm like, oh my God, why, is, <laughs> why can't I? Yeah, I, I just realized that her, her link from Monday is going to work for me. So that's why. Uh, yeah, because I sat right there and I kind of, I'm not going to lie, y'all. I kind of got worried because I'm like, it's not like Ms. Johnson to not have the class no, visible no, 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 no later no. than 835. Yeah. But then I remembered like, oh, yeah, we have a new instructor. Duh. That's right. That's okay. right. I got it written down now. So I'm, kind of, yeah. I'm calm now. Because I was worried, like, I don't want to miss class. No, you're not going to miss I stayed class. up too late last night catching up on work to miss class. <laughs> <laughs> I was up till 3 a.m. submitting work. And there you go. There you go. All right. So we're all in. All right. We're gathering, gathering, gathering. And. Nine so far. Able to come right in. Good. All right. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was eleven mod. Okay, we got 10 in now. Four people entered the waiting room. View, admit, 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 admit. There we go. All right. Good. Good. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to have you here. Good morning. Here. Good morning. Morning. All right. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. We're still spinning and twirling here. See how many we have and how many we need. Let's see here. How many we got? Mm -hmm. Come on. Great book. Yeah. Take me over. I've got her attendance here. Mm-hmm. 
Fighting that side. Okay. Can y'all still hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I blinked out for a second. All right. So let's see here. What do we got? We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. We got 30. All right. Yeah, this is the name. Okay. Okay. All right. We got 12 people in here so far. Twenty-nine people. All right. Okay. So I gotta wait for everybody else to get in here. Let's see. Let's see who all we have so far. Oh. 
Profit. P R O P A G T. She is. Super, Isaac. Destiny. Morgan says she's still not able to get in. Really? Uh, see here. Morgan. Let's see you. She says she's still in the waiting room still. In the waiting room. Okay. There's another waiting room. All right. Is she in the waiting room for this link? I'm wondering. She might have the wrong link. Tell her to check the announcements. That's what I told her. I'll yeah. Hold on one second. <laughs> yeah. Fiddle.
She says she is. Okay. In this one, in the white, in this one, yours. She's in this one. All right. So let's see. Let's see what it looks like. Um, let's see. There's some indication. Oh, shit. There we go. Another waiting room. Okay. Waiting room, waiting room. Okay. Um, let's see here. All right. Hmm. All right. Let's, uh, let me find Morgan here. Morgan Thompson. All right. So I'll copy that. And I will invite her by email. So by default. Send it from here. Okay. And send it to Morgan. Morgan. Yeah, I'm sending Morgan an email it has link in it. That's Sarah from the Troy. Okay. All right. Sorry, Mr. Converse. I just got the email with okay. your Zoom ID number. <laughs> I was still trying to get in on Mrs. Johnson's. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. That's what I was wondering. Okay. All right, so, okay, da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. okay, we still don't have Morgan. I just sent Morgan the link. Okay. Okay, start up top here. Dave Fox. Sarah, she is here. Okay, twenty five. Go, got her. Zuda, Tanya. NYA Tanya. There she is. Okay. And Brianna. With one in. There we go. Got her, Destiny, Felicia. I told her to log, like get out of it and try to get back into it. Yeah, log out, log in and, and use the link and that, that should pop her in. Okay. Mm. Little. Lawson, Lawson, there we go, gotcha, Baker, I believe I've got already, yes, Tim's got a good box, name, live, super, tell yeah. Okay, we're at 19, we're 10 shy. We are 10 shy. All right. 
Okay. As you continue to trickle in, um, I will admit you, but this whole thing is being recorded and I will send you the link for this as I posted on YouTube, same with the link from Monday's discussion. So you won't miss anything if you're not logging in dead on time, if you're having a technical issue, but we do want to begin. So let's do that. All right. Now, last I was here, we were talking about special senses and we had discussed the, uh, the eye. And I told you guys that normally in lab, uh, when we're doing a live lab in a class like this, um, we, we do a dissection. We actually do an eye dissection. And it's open recent, 11 mod. Okay. And since you guys don't have the opportunity to do that, what I wanted to do is show you what a sheep eye dissection looks like. And the reason we're doing this is to sort of familiarize you with the organ itself. So we will open up here. Recent. And we go here. Yeah, I, am I on a Okay, and then what I want to do is a new share. And I'll do that. I'll share that with you. Yeah, I, am I on a switch? Okay, here. In the beginning of the section with, with any dissection, it's always important to look at the external features first before jumping in there with your instruments. Um, you want to make sure that you try to rec see anything you can recognize here. I recognize connective tissue. I recognize some muscles, the external or extrinsic muscles that attach to the eyeball and would move it around in the eye orbit in the socket. Um, on, also on the back, you'll see something that looks much whiter than these yellowy, fatty, and then connective tissues. And that little round white thing right there is the optic nerve coming out the back of the eyeball. Now, there are going to be several layers of tissue in the eye, the outermost, very similar to what we saw in the central nervous system, the toughest. And this would be um, what we call the fibrous tunic. It's tough fibrous connective tissue. And the white colored connective tissue on the outside, we refer to as the sclera or the white of the eye. Um, the more clear portion, which in a healthy, normal functioning eye would be much clearer than this. It's going to be cloudier due to the preservative and the fact that the animal is no longer living. Um, that's the cornea. And that's continuous with the sclera. It's one continuous layer. Um, the, the normal functioning eye would be much clearer than this. It's going to be cloudier due to the preservative and the fact that the animal is no longer living, um, that's the cornea. And that's continuous with the sclera. It's one continuous layer. Um, the, this, because this is really, really tough, you, I do not recommend using a scalpel because again, as we saw with the dura mater on the brain, very hard to cut through that outer layer. And as you're pushing really hard and you finally get through, you're gonna, <laughs> put so much pressure on there, you're going to have a little fountain of, of inner juice. So what I recommend is a scissor with some fine points on it. And I like to try to snip a little opening so that I can get one point of the scissor through there. Maybe poke a little hole. As you can see, this is pretty tough stuff. I have to really cut away. Oh, now I see a little juice, a little fluid coming out of there. We'll talk about that fluid in a moment when we get on the inside and take a look. We're going to cut right through the cornea. We're going to go all the way around the eyeball. Gently. 
Remember, it's a little package with delicate things inside that you don't want to harm. Even though it's pretty tough. I'm going to go this way. That is tough stuff, I'll tell you. And we're going to kind of open that up like, like you would open an egg. Whoop, look at that eye that popped right out of there. Okay. So we should see several interesting things here. The very liquid or watery material was found in the, the cavity here. Call the, oops, I can't get to it. Okay. We have the um, anterior chamber here and the posterior chamber back here. The dividing point would be this middle layer of the eye that contains the iris, in this case up in the front. Um, and that, that iris, which is made up of muscular tissue, is continuous with the middle layer of our three layers, which is called the choroid. And in that front an anterior area is the aqueous humor or very fluid watery material. In this larger posterior chamber, we have this gelatin-like material called the vitreous humor. Vitreous means glass, and so it's sort of glassy looking and um, very gelatinous. And that, you can see this, this right here is the lens, which looks white from the preservative and lack of uh, circulatory flow. This one um, would be clear in, an, in a normal healthy eye. But that lens, we'll take a look at that a little bit more closely in a little bit. And then you'll notice this pattern on the front that um, has little lines radiating out from the center is an imprint with pigment from the inside of this eye. And that imprint comes from the shape of the muscles that are part of that iris. So we're gonna cut that out and take a look at it. We're going to see two types of muscles surrounding that, that are part of that iris and surround the opening in the middle, which is called the pupil. Okay. And what you hopefully can see, if the light, is the light good there? Yep, yep. What we can see is that around the middle part of the pupil are circular muscles that go all the way around the opening. And then attached to the outer edge of that are some what we call radiating or radial muscles that come out. Okay. The when if the muscles in that circular layer here were to get shorter, they would make the hole smaller. So the circular muscles are constricting and they constrict the pupil. The radial muscles, when they get shorter, pull that const those constrictors out of the way and so it makes the pupil larger. So these are your dilating muscles, the radial ones. I like to think of them as like rays of the sun. See the pattern of like the rays of the sun on there. And then the other thing you'll notice in here in this chamber where we have the pigment, something that we don't see very often, we don't see in human eyes, and we only see in some animals, particularly animals that have better nocturnal vision than we do, is a structure called the tapetum lucidum. It looks a little bit like, I'm going to push this creamy colored white material, which is retina aside, and we'll get to that, we'll look in the other part of the eye at that retina in a moment. But when you can, what you can see is this beautiful iridescent turquoise green area that actually helps animals trap more light inside that chamber um, to help them see better at night and that's why when you you flash a light in the eyes of a deer or a dog or a raccoon or a cat it'll uh, reflect back at you in a usually a different colors for different types of animals yellow green orange and that's that tapetum lucidum. And hum, that's why human eyes don't do that, I guess, unless you're a vampire or something. And then, <laughs> so apparently we have some interesting eye things. Now, this creamy stuff that I moved aside was our innermost layer, what's called the neural layer, the choroid layer, which is this middle layer and which has the pigment on it and which goes continuous with the muscles that, the intrinsic internal muscles that regulate the pupil. That layer is referred to as the vascular layer. And the innermost layer is referred to as the neural layer is basically the retina. And the retina is very, very delicate. And one of the roles of this vitreous or glass-like humor is that it pushes the um, retina up flat against the back of the eyeball, kind of like 
if you were trying to project a movie onto a sheet on the wall and you want that sheet to be nice and flat or your images would be distorted, this is your sheet. And that vitreous humor presses that sheet out and you can see if I just disturb it a little bit. So if I were to, someone were to have a blow to the head, a significant blow to the head, it could disturb this enough that it would wrinkle like this or shrivel up. And that's called the detached retina. So a bad head injury can cause that sometimes can cause permanent damage, sometimes can re be repaired. What you'll notice is that it just slips right off of that choroid layer, except for one little spot. I can't seem to get it off this one little spot. That one little spot where it's attached is the spot where all of the axons from all of those nerve cells are going to exit the eyeball into the optic nerve. And so if I pull on that, you can see that little round opening, which on the other side, is our, there's that optic nerve we found earlier when we were looking at the external part of the eyeball. Oh. This white structure right there is connected to that. And that's your blind spot because in that spot, you only have axons, no receptors. That means you can't see right there. And Charlie, so that Charlie. little, Charlie. that little blind spot right there. there, that little spot where that's attached has no receptors, just axons. And so therefore that's your blind spot. Your brain learns to compensate for that in your images. <clears throat> So you get enough information from the surrounding area that you don't notice that you have a blind spot. Your brain helps you to not notice that at all. Um, the last thing we're going to take a look at is the lens. We're going to kind of separate this lens off of here. When I was a younger person many years ago, we were working on frogs. We used to, they're so hard. So bouncy, those little lenses. We used to play marbles with them. But one interesting thing that you'll notice, um, if you, this is where you might try and use a scalpel, but you have to be careful because it is round. You know how it is when you're cutting peas, shoot across your plate. If you cut into it, what you'll find is it's a lot like an onion. Notice I make a lot of food references in that it has lots of layers inside there. Now, I don't know if we can see that real well. Let's see if I can grab that with a forceps. Maybe it's a little slick. Hmm. Let's see here. And get the light on that just right. It has layers of protein. It's, it's just special proteins in that lens that are layer upon layer upon layer. And this is what focuses your image. And this lens is also connected to a set of muscles within that uh, choroid layer, um, which, which are attached to some special little ligaments called suspensory ligaments. And we call the little batch of muscles at the ends of these suspensory ligaments suspended right here behind the pupil. We call that the ciliary body. And that ciliary body, when, um, when your brain is trying to help you focus, it will pull and that will make the lens stretch and get a little flatter. And that will change the position of the image that you're looking at. And if it's, um, it loosens it up, that image moves a little bit closer. So it tries to get it to hit right on the back of that eyeball where the retina is. And if you don't do that very well, then you might need glasses. The glasses would then correct that distance in order to make it sit right on the back of that, right on the retina, your, your projector screen, so to speak, on the back of your eyeball. The other interesting thing about these proteins in the eye is when we go back and we look at this cornea, so usually the retina would be sort of clear, pretty clear, and the cornea should be clear. Um, they can get cloudy as you get older or from certain um, injuries or diseases. And you can get what are called cataracts and have those replaced or have the cataracts broken up. The cataracts are crystals that form in here and cloud up these, these layers. Um, but the material that's in the sclera is exactly the same material that's in the cornea. Why is this one white and this one clear? And that's because of the way that the fibers are aligned. And the fibers in the sclera are very uh, random and they're kind of um, a reticulum or a mesh-like network where they're all going different directions and that makes it opaque. No light can get through. But it would be kind of like if you, you know, were taping over something, you put lots of tape over there because you don't want to let any light in. Over here, the fibers all run in one direction. They're all parallel, kind of like Venetian blinds. So then that allows light in between those fibers, which gives it the appearance of being clear. Um, but basically it's the same kind of material. It's a collagen for the most part um, and keratin. 
structural proteins that are sturdy. And there you have a sheep eye. Hmm. Now, this is the only part of the human body that doesn't get um, oxygen from the blood supply. Is that correct, Cornea? Or is that? Where's the full sclera? Uh, yeah, there's no, no, there's a few places in the body that don't get good blood oh, supply, okay. but where there are dense regular connective tissue, you do not get generally great blood supplies. Okay. And that's why those things are very hard to heal, like ligaments, tendons, cartilage has very little blood supply, and then the sclera has no blood supply. Okay. And um, the, actually the cornea doesn't either. It's interesting when somebody gets a red or a bloodshot eye, something we can't see on this sheep eye right now, when it's in the sheep, there'll be a very thin layer. In other words, the skin that's on the sheep's face and same thing on a human comes down over the surface of the cornea, just a thin, thin layer of skin. It's so thin that it's oh. clear. We call that thin layer of living skin. It's continuous with your eyelid under your eyelid. Oh. We call that layer the conjunctiva. And when oh. some that has blood vessels in it. And when somebody gets an infection in that or it gets irritated, then the blood flow increases in there to bring, you know, to heal. And so they'll get a bloodshot eye. They'll get a red eye. So the redness is from the conjunctiva, not from the cornea or the sclera itself. Okay. Yeah. I, my honor switch. Okay. So that's an actual sheep eye dissection. Okay. Typically, you do that in lab with a dissection kit, but here we've done it virtually. All right. So. Let's talk a little bit more about the eye. Okay. Remember that the eye has three tunics. Okay. The tunics are layers in the eye that have uh, different properties. The outer tunic is called the fibrous tunic. And it made it, it's made up of the sclera, the white of the eye, and the cornea. The middle tunic is the choroid, which is shown here. Okay. And the choroid is um, filled with blood vessels and contains the ciliary body and the suspensory ligaments. And its purpose is to nourish the inner tunic, which is the neural tunic, and that's made up of the retina, which contains the photoreceptors. And it's the photoreceptors that um, are gonna change the, uh, the light stimulus into electrical information that we'll ultimately interpret as vision, okay? If you lose the, um, the contact between the retina and the choroid, that the retina can begin to die. And if the retina begins to die, um, you're going to lose that portion of your visual field, okay? The choroid provides the retina with a rich supply of blood, but it also contains dark pigment that's located in the choroid to absorb excess light so it doesn't bounce around after it comes into the back of the eyeball. You remember from the dissection video when she opened up the eye how dark it was inside, and that's to keep light from bouncing around. A, a dark object is not going to reflect any visible light. It's going to absorb all light. That's why it looks dark. Okay. Whereas an object with a color in it is going to reflect those wavelengths back at you. Okay. And that's what you're going to see. Persons with albinism wear sunglasses because they don't have the necessary melanin in the choroid layer to absorb the excess light. And so it's very difficult for them to see. Okay, albinism is a condition where your body doesn't make the pigment melanin, and so um, your skin is, is, is very pale. You have um, basically pink eyes, meaning you have pink irises, right? And it's a, it's a recessive gene. To have albinism, you have to have a defective gene from both your mother and your father in order for you to have that condition, okay? The ciliary body of the choroid is what's attached to the suspensory ligaments and those are attached to the lens. And that's how the lens changes shape. When you look at things that are close up or far away, <coughs> the shape of the lens has to change <coughs> so that you can keep the image focused on that part of the retina 
that has the greatest concentration of cones, which is called the macula lutea, okay? <coughs> and your cone photoreceptors are where we do our bright light and our color vision, okay? The anterior portion of the choroid is the iris, which regulates the amount of light that gets into the eye. So it's like a window into the rest of the eye. And the opening in the middle is known as the pupil. So in bright light, what happens is that there's smooth muscle that will cause the pupil to constrict and get tinier. And in low light conditions, the pupil will open back up to let more light in. I don't know if, you, if you've ever experienced this when you, when you go to a movie theater and you walk into it and it's all dark, it takes a second for you to adjust to the lower light levels, right? And that's because in part, your pupils are widening. You have to wait for that to happen so that you can let more light in so that you can see, right? And then when the movie's over, when you walk out into the parking lot in the bright sunshine, you're temporarily blinded by the bright light and that's because you got to wait for your pupils to constrict again, okay? In older people, one of the things that happens is that that reaction, that pupil reaction slows down. So at night when they're driving, a lot of times when people come at them, especially with their brights on, they can get blinded because their pupils don't constrict fast enough for them to be able to see, right? To cut off the amount of light that's coming into their eye. That's just one of the reasons that um, it's difficult for older people to drive. Okay. All right. Your retina, right? This is the money part of the eyeball. And this is where we turn light and color into what we interpret as vision. This is where transduction occurs, which is the act of taking the stimulus and then turning that into a, a chemical and then an electrical signal. Okay. It's the inner layer of the posterior eyeball. And it's where the photoreceptors, the rods and cones are located. The optic disc is the area that has no photoreceptors on it. So that's your blind spot. And you can test for your blind spot. Um, let's, uh, uh, this is kind of fun to do it at home or if you wanna do it in lab, you can do it in lab too. So you can take a three by five card, right? Maybe I talked about this the other day. Okay, and let's admit Jackie. And then we've got a, a plus and a dot here, all right? And what you do is you take that three by five card and you hold it out at arm's length. And let's say you're doing it with your right arm, okay? Then you can close your right eye with your right arm extended and you can look with your left eye across the card, okay, at the dot, right? And then as you bring the card closer to you with your arm, you'll reach a point where the other symbol, let's use uh, white, will vanish, okay? And that's the distance at which that part of the image would hit your blind spot. Okay. Now, the reason that we don't have a blind spot when we look with both our eyes ahead is because the blind spots in different locations in the visual field in the right and the left eye. So the right eye covers for the left and the left eye covers for the right. And the result is you get a full visual field. And the, the information that you get from both eyes is a little bit different. If you hold up your finger and you close your right eye, close your left eye, what you'll see is it looks like your fingers moving from left to right and right to left. What's actually happening is you're looking at a different angle with your visual field from one or the other eye. Well, what happens when you open both your eyes is that your brain takes that information and turns that into depth perception, right? And so that's how we're able to judge how far away something is because both our eyes are in the front of our head it makes it easier for us to determine how far away something is, okay? And if you wanna test that, try to play catch with somebody who has got one eye closed, right? It's very difficult to do, okay? 
So this is the neural tunic is what we call it. That's where the photoreceptors are. Um, the highest concentration of photoreceptors is in a region called the fovea centralis and it's in the um, it's in the fovea centralis that you have the greatest density of cones and that's where your greatest bright light visual acuity is right the fovea centralis sits in the middle of the structure called the macula lutea okay um, what can happen with the retina is that it can detach from the eye the retina is only linked to the eye <clears throat> uh, physically in two places, right? It's linked to the eye at the optic disc, okay? This structure here, oops, I meant to get the laser out. At the optic disc, right? And it's also linked to the eye physically at an area called the aura serratia, which is the front part of the retina that's about three quarters of the way towards the front of the eye, right? And the rest of the retina is sealed in place by the vitreous humor, which is a clear liquid that fills the back of the eyeball. So if you take a shot to the head, like they do in boxing, you can wrinkle your retina and you can lose your, your vision, okay? This is why Sugar Ray Leonard retired, it was because they told him if he took any more headshots, he would go blind because he would basically crumple his retina and he wouldn't be able to see anymore, okay? Another thing that can happen to your retina is um, a, a condition we know as macular degeneration, where you can bleed behind your retina or you can get growths behind your retina and they push the retina away from the back of the eyeball. And the result is that you lose the contact with the blood supply and then those nerve cells start to die. Those nerve cells and photoreceptors start to die and you start to lose your visual field. And the treatment for that is to use lasers to seal the bleeding blood vessels. Or in the case of dry macular degeneration, where you get growths behind the retina that push it away from the back of the eyeball, we can use the lasers to vaporize those little growths that are called drusen. Okay. Um, your rods are for your light intensity, right? And they're scattered throughout the retina um, fairly evenly, while the cones are primarily in the macula and particularly in the fovea, and that's your color vision, okay? Now, the, the coenzyme that you need in order for the rods and the cones to turn light into an electrical and then a chemical signal is called retinol. Okay, and retinol is derived from vitamin A, which you get with your yellow and orange vegetables. Okay, it's a fat soluble vitamin. And um, what happens with the vitamin A is it becomes embedded in the rhodopsin and the iodopsin, which are the, the membrane proteins that are in the rods and cones that turn the light energy into an electrical current that results in a chemical release, okay? So if you lack vitamin A, you're gonna have trouble with your vision, okay? You might remember when you were a kid, your mother told you to um, make sure to eat your carrots to improve your vision. Well, she wasn't pulling your leg. Carrots are packed with vitamin A and the result of having all that vitamin A is you can make enough retinol to get the photoreceptors to work, okay? Um, while we're on the topic of fat soluble vitamins and vitamin A in particular, um, I can tell you a little story about the use of vitamin A. Um, back when I was in high school, which was many, many years ago, okay? Um, they used to sell a, um, a compound out of the back of Rolling Stone and Guitar World and Cream Magazine. Those were all music and pop culture magazines. I think Rolling Stone is still around. And it was called Tan in a Bottle. And the idea was in high school, if you couldn't afford to go to Florida on spring break, you could buy tan in a bottle and you would take these capsules 
and in about two days you turn orange and you would pretend that that's your tan right so look at me i went to florida and i got this wonderful tan well what tan in a bottle actually was were high dosage amounts of vitamin a and so what you were doing was giving yourself toxic doses of vitamin a the reason that you can do that is because vitamins a d e and k are fat soluble which means they dissolve in your body's adipose tissue which means that your body has almost an infinite capacity to store these compounds in addition to that those compounds can go almost anywhere they want in the body because a fat soluble compound can pass right through a cell membrane and that's one of the reasons that fat soluble compounds can be dangerous an example um, comes to us from the 1800s okay uh, back in the 1800s um, hats were very popular they're still popular today but they were really popular in the 1800s and they used to treat the hat bands with elemental mercury which is a lipid soluble metal and so the the people that ran the haberdasheries, the hatters, would try on all these hats and they would get a big dose. There's Morgan. They would get a big dose of elemental mercury in their system and that would go into their brain. Okay. And elemental mercury is neurotoxic. And so what would happen is they would stop, start to lose cognitive function. Okay. So they wouldn't, basically their brain, the way their neurons would work would, would, would start to be interrupted by the fact that this elemental mercury was screwing up their neurons, right? And so this is the origin of the character in Alice in Wonderland known as the Mad Hatter, okay? Um, another practice in the 1800s, and I guess they still do it today, is chimney sweep. Although back in the 1800s, the chimney sweep would actually go down the chimney and clean out the junk and he would get a big dose of coal dust and in the coal dust um, there was a compound called diethyl stilbesterone which is another lipid soluble compound nonpolar compound and what that did was that would give them testicular cancer because the lipid soluble compound would sink into their tissues and can bind to dna and make mutations and that can make cancer cells okay um, a, a problem here in the U.S. for a long time was leaded gasoline and lead paint, okay? So one of the things that used to happen in a lot of low-income areas is that lead paint would flake off the walls and the kids would eat the lead paint chips. And what would happen is that they would get a dose of lead and that is also neurotoxic, okay? And that would result in cognitive deficit, right? So they would um, do worse in school, they would score poorly on their tests. The same thing with leaded gasoline, okay? So we eliminated that from gasoline and from paint in order to avoid that problem. This is one of the reasons we also worry about mercury in fish, okay, is because it's a lipid-soluble compound. So anything that can, that's lipid-soluble that can pass through your skin can stay in your body for a long time. It can go anywhere it wants. In the 60s, there was a hallucinogenic drug called LSD, okay? Lysergic acid diethylamide was a hallucinogen that you would take by um, putting it on a sugar cube or there used to be a version of it called window pane that you would put on your eye and it would absorb right into the fluids and it could go right into the brain because it was lipid soluble and it would produce these hallucinogenic effects. And so a lot of people dropped acid in the 60s and then they stopped and they thought they were free and clear and then later on what would happen is that some of the residual LSD in their system would pop back out of their of their lipid stores in their body for instance the myelin in their in their nervous system and they would have a, basically a flashback right they would re-experience a hallucinogenic event because the compound was out and, and doing its thing again Okay, so anything that's lipid soluble, you want to be very careful about. Okay, we used to have mercury thermometers, and one of the things that kids would do with mercury thermometers 
is they would bite down on the thermometer and break it and they'd swallow the mercury. And so what you would do when that happens is that you would give them a drug called an emetic, E-M-E-T-I-C, right? Which induces vomiting so that you could get the mercury out of their system before the stomach acid turned it into something that was, was neurotoxic, okay? So we would cause them to throw up, you get the mercury out of their system and they wouldn't have to worry about those toxic doses. We don't have many mercury thermometers anymore unless you're talking about a thermometer that's not used on a human being, okay? And so that's one of the reasons that we got rid of it. But lipid soluble compounds, you have to be careful with, okay? All right, cavities of the eyeball, all right? The posterior cavity is between the lens and the retina, and that's where the vitreous humor is, and the anterior cavity is between the lens and the cornea, and that's where the aqueous humor is. So what's, what's the deal with these? Okay, this is transparent. This is transparent, the lens. The cornea is transparent. And of course, the aqueous humor is transparent. And so the idea is that the light can pass through all of these structures and get to the sweet spot on the retina, which is right about here. And that's your fovea, okay? All the while, the image as it's passing through these transparent layers the, the light rays are bending so that they hit the proper spot on the retina and that's called refraction, okay? Now, the aqueous humor is made from your blood supply and normally it's produced and then it drains into something called the canal of Schlem, which is a little opening down here, all right? And if we, um, if, if the drainage is improper, right, what's gonna happen is that the pressure is going to build up in the anterior cavity and can crush the retina, okay? And that is going to produce a condition known as glaucoma, right? So you can see here um, how, the, how the ciliary body, which is part of the choroid, makes the aqueous humor from the blood and then it circulates into the anterior chamber and then it drains in here. And so people have conditions such as narrow angle glaucoma, where this little opening is kind of pinched off and the pressure builds up and then you squash the neurons and the photoreceptors in the retina. And you also squash the blood vessels that nourish the retina. And then that part of the retina begins to die and start to lose your visual field. So that's why um, they call um, glaucoma the silent thief of sight, okay? Because it, it slowly robs you of your vision while being not terribly painful, believe it or not, which is kind of weird, but they test this by testing the, uh, the, the turgor pressure using a device they put on your cornea, right? And if the pressure is really high, they know that you've got either too much production of aqueous or too little drainage of it, okay? The treatment, uh, drugs that reduce fluid content in the body, such as diuretics and, um, there are also drugs that relieve the pain, okay? One that you may have heard of is to use medical marijuana for this treatment for two reasons. It reduces the pain and it temporarily reduces the pressure, okay? But it is still controversial, right? All right. The muscles that move the eyeball are called the extrinsic muscles and they are skeletal muscles. And the intrinsic muscles move structures in the eyeball, and those include the iris, which controls the diameter of the pupil, and the ciliary muscles, which control the shape of the lens, okay? So you can see here the different muscles, right? You've got on the top, the superior oblique and the superior rectus. Then you have the lateral rectus. Then you have the inferior oblique, okay? And an inferior rectus, and then the one that we can't see which is the medial rectus, okay? So who does what? Well, we can tell you. Let's, uh, let's go to the pen here. So we go to the pen. So the, the lateral rectus is controlled by the abducens nerve, okay? The superior oblique is controlled by the trochlear nerve and all the rest are controlled by cranial nerve three, which is the 
oculomotor. So this is one of the reasons that the doctor, when you go for your, your physical, will typically tell you to look up, look down, look left, look right, because he's looking for problems with those movements of those muscles, which can tell him either that those nerves are damaged or that those regions of the brainstem and the brain that control that nerve pathway may be damaged. And that happens occasionally, okay? All right, the, tr the three intrinsic eye muscles, there's the circular muscle of the iris that, can, that performs uh, constriction of the pupil causing a condition known as meiosis, okay? And these contain muscarinic receptors in them, okay? So this is one of the things that um, we can use as a, a topical that uh, we can use to constrict the pupil if we wanna do that. Eye drops can either constrict or dilate the pupil depending on what they have in them. And then the radial muscle contraction causes dilation of the pupil and that's a condition known as mydriasis, okay? Alpha-1 receptors are on these muscles, all right? And then the ciliary muscles are gonna be involved in changing the shape of the lens for refraction, okay? Um, the ciliary muscles and the constriction of the iris are controlled by the oculomotor nerve, that's cranial nerve three, okay? And so that's one of the things that we can test with reflexes. And you can do this at home or in lab if you want, is you can, in a dark room, have somebody with a, with a pen light, not a laser pointer, a pen light, like a flashlight, shine it into your pupil. And what you'll see is that it will constrict, all right? And if you move the light to the other eye, you'll see that the other eye constricts at the same time that the, the eye with the light in it is constricting and it's called the consensual reflex, okay? And that's a parasympathetic response of cranial nerve three, okay? So these regulate the amount of light that gets in so that you can have a clear image, okay? Pupillary function is evaluated by noting the size, shape, and the reactivity to light. And there's a acronym called P-E-R-R-L-A, PERLA, that's an assessment term for pupillary function, which means pupils equal round reactive to light and accommodation. If they are not, okay, that can be an indication either of um, drug action or if the pupils are what we call fixed and dilated, that can indicate death along with other physical symptoms, okay? In myodrysis, sympathetic nerve stimulation causes pupillary dilation, and in meiosis, parasympathetic stimulation results in constriction. So you can test these at home as well, right? You can, um, you want to see pupillary dilation, what you can do is get a volunteer, right? And then what you do is you reach around and you pinch the back of their neck when they're not expecting it, and their pupils will dilate, okay? And that is a fight or flight response, okay? And then if you wanna see constriction, you simply do the pen light, right? And you can see the pupils constrict, okay? So the constriction is testing a cranial set of cranial nerves, right? And the dilation is actually testing um, sympathetic postganglionic neurons, all right? So this is again, why the doctor does these tests, okay? Okay some other conditions, right? Uh, ptosis, which is a drooping eyelid. A sty, which basically is an occlusion of the, uh, the production of sebum from glands that are in the eyelids, the palpary, okay? Conjunctivitis or pink eye, which is a viral or a bacterial infection of the conjunctiva and very contagious, okay? If you have pink eye, uh, you shouldn't come to work, okay? Because if you touch your eyes and touch something else and somebody else touches that and touches their eye, they're gonna get it, okay? Um, pink eye can be caused by toxins, can be caused by bacterial or viral infection, okay? And then strabismus, where you've got um, eyes that don't have the same direction of visual field. 
and that can indicate either a defect in the nerves that talk to the muscles that move the eyeball, or it can be a problem in the muscles themselves, or it can actually be a problem with your vestibular apparatus, your balance apparatus, okay? Um, one of the ways that they can check that, and they only do this if you are complaining of a condition known as vertigo, okay, is that they can tilt you down and tilt you up, tilt you down and tilt you up. The doctor is tilting your trunk, right? And then what they'll do is they'll, they'll look at your eyes and they'll see how long it takes for your eyes to quit tracking, okay? To quit, quit wiggling in their orbits. And that can tell the doctor whether you've got what they call a peripheral or a central defect, right? A, a central defect would be a problem um, in the central nervous system with the way that the vestibular apparatus um, connects to the brain stem and to your, your balance cortex in your brain, okay? But if you've got one side or the other with a, a problem with nystagmus or strabismus, um, that can indicate a problem uh, sometimes at the level of the vestibule or the semicircular canals, which are part of your balance apparatus in your eye, okay? Strabismus um, can be a, 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 con a persistent condition or it can be a transient condition depending on the cause, okay? And the fix, if it's a persistent condition, right? Um, one of the fixes is to put an eye patch over the good eye and then force them to use their nerves and their muscles that move the eyeball so that they can turn their gaze in a way that they can see, okay? So what you're doing is you're kind of you're kind of weakening the good eye and strengthening the bad eye. And then by the time the patch comes off, the strength should be equal and the gaze should be equal, okay? Okay, the photopupillary reflex is again, what we talked about, right? You shine visible light into the eye the other eye's pupil will also constrict. That's the consensual reflex. And those are from ciliary muscles that come from the ciliary body, okay? And so that constriction, that's from nerve endings from the oculomotor nerve, okay? Um, the other thing that happens um, with cranial nerve three is a condition known as accommodation, which is where you focus on an object closer to your eye and what happens is the ciliary muscles pull on suspensory ligaments that pull on the lens causing a change in the shape of the lens so that the the, the object the the thing that's close to your eye stays in sharp focus okay that's what accommodation is doing for you is it's shortening the focal length which is the the length of the light rays from where they hit the eye to where they hit the business end of the retina, which is the fovea, okay? Emetropia is normal vision, okay? Now, one of the things that happens as we get older is a condition known as presbyopia. And in presbyopia, the lens gets stiffer and it's harder for it to change its shape. And the result of that is that we can't focus on things that are close up as easily. And that means the images close to our eyes become blurry. So what we do is we have reading glasses so that we can reduce the focal length of things that are near our eye and we can still read, okay? I have presbyopia and I have to have reading glasses on when things are less than a foot away from me. Okay, whereas if y'all who have young eyes and uncorrected vision, good vision, you can probably see real sharp way up close. Okay, and that's because your lenses are still flexible. Okay, all right. You can see here that the bending of light is something that happens when light rays that reflect off of an object, and let's go to the laser pointer here, go from an optically less dense to an optically more dense medium, right? Less dense would be air or a vacuum and more dense would be anything else, right? 
So light rays come in and when they hit something more dense, um, they will be bent so that they focus on the sweet spot of the retina, okay? That happens regardless of what you're looking at, okay? So the refraction is done by all the transparent layers, but most of the refractive power in the eye is in the cornea, okay? And so that's one of the reasons that we can sometimes correct what we call errors of refraction by using corrective lenses or by using laser corrective surgery to change the shape of the cornea and get you to have normal vision as opposed to myopia or hyperopia, which is nearsightedness or farsightedness, okay? Now, when the object comes nearer to your eyes, okay, um, what happens is that the lens has to get fatter in order to bend those rays more extremely so that they can focus on the fovea, all right? But when the object is far away, the bending is minimal, okay? With no lens in the eye, you wouldn't be able to focus on the image because you would lose some of that refractive power. With the lens, of course, you can bend it, okay? Uh, another thing that can happen is a condition known as cataract, right? And in cataract, what happens is that the lens, instead of being transparent, becomes cloudy. So instead of letting light bend as it passes through, the light scatters and you can't get an image out of that. So the fix for that is to replace the lens in the eye. Or they can do that as an outpatient surgery. We make an incision in the eye. We remove the lens from its little envelope here and we swap it out for a pretend lens, which can either be a flexible lens or it might be a fixed, uh, a fixed lens, right? And the result of that is gonna be um, that you'll have your normal vision back, right? Because now you have a transparent layer instead of an opaque one, okay? So those are some of our options and that's what refraction is all about, okay? We should also say that the cornea can become cloudy and you can replace the cornea, right? The cornea is avascular and so it gets its oxygen from the air because it stays moist because of your tears, okay? But because it doesn't have any blood vessels in it, it has a condition known as immune privilege. So you can get a transplanted cornea from somebody who's recently died and it can take the place of a cornea that has become opaque or has become damaged in a way that it doesn't grow back, okay? So if we look here at our photoreceptors, right? We have our night vision and our color vision, right? Our night vision, obviously that's low light and the photoreceptors that do most of that work are called rods and the color vision, that's bright light and the photoreceptors that do most of that work are called cones. So cone for color, C for color, okay? All right, so in low light conditions, the pupil's gonna dilate and that allows more light to get into the eye. The dilated pupil allows the light rays to scatter along the periphery of the retina and stimulate the rods and that gives us our black and white vision. In well lit environments, the pupil's constricted and more light goes towards the cone rich portion of the retina, which is the fovea. And the image produced by the stimulation of the cones is colored and very sharp, okay? Now, what's interesting about this, all right, is that um, if, and, and I know this is weird, you, you're not really aware of this unless you really try hard to, to overcome this reflex, but when you think you're looking straight ahead, okay, your eyes, believe it or not, are wiggling just a little teeny tiny bit. And the reason for that is to make sure that we don't run out of retinol for your photoreceptors to work, okay? One of the things that happens when light hits your photoreceptors is that the retinol part becomes unattached from the photoreceptor and it goes in to the pigmented retina in order to be regenerated so that it can be 
reused again the next time the a photon of light hits it okay so your your eyes actually are moving a teeny tiny bit even when you think you have a a fixed gaze so one of the things you can do if you concentrate really hard stare at an object like a fixed object on the wall okay like a dot or something and try really hard to lock your gaze as hard as you can okay it takes take some concentration and what you'll find is that you'll start to lose your visual field you will actually go blind temporarily because you've bleached the photoreceptors that are picking up the image that you're staring at and the result is that you'll get what's called a whiteout all right but the minute you go back to a normal gaze or turn your eyes you'll recover your visual field and then those photoreceptors will get the retinol back and they'll regenerate okay so it's kind of an interesting little trick to try it doesn't hurt you okay just uh focus real hard and you'll see that your your visual field begins to disappear from the from the periphery to the center it's kind of an interesting thing to to demonstrate okay so photoreceptors are going to produce the nerve impulses which are going to end up going from the photoreceptors to a set of cells in the retina that are called bipolar cells. Those are neurons with two extensions coming off of them. And then those will go to ganglion cells, which are actually the axons of cranial nerve two, okay, the optic nerve. And then that's going to go project back to a structure called, this little crosshair called the optic chiasm, okay. And then that's going to project back the optic tracks to an area of the brain called the thalamus, which basically is the brain's router. It makes sure that um, sensory information goes to the right cortex, the correct cortex of the brain that's designed to deal with it, right? So it sends visual information to the occipital lobe, it sends auditory information to the temporal lobe, and so on, okay? The only special sense that bypasses the thalamus, as we already know, is olfaction, which is smell, and that goes straight back to the temporal lobe from the olfactory bulbs, okay? Um, it's also an interesting fact that the right hemisphere of the brain deals with the left part of the visual field in both eyes and vice versa because of the way that we're wired, okay? All right, so the pathway of light, you can see here, right? From the cornea to the aqueous humor, through the pupil, through the lens, through the vitreous humor, and then we hit the retina. Uh, we're gonna go through the ganglion cells first, then the bipolar cells, and then we'll hit the rods and cones, and then we're gonna hit the pigmented retina and the choroid, and then the path of light will end there because that's a dark surface. And then the electrical information is going to go from the rods and cones um, to the bipolar cells, to the ganglion cells, which are get basically cranial nerve two. And then that's going to go from, the, from cranial nerve two back to the optic chiasm, back to the optic tracts, which is going to go back to the thalamus. And then from the thalamus, another set of neurons going to go back to the occipital lobe. And that's where we're going to deal with vision. Okay, so in the occipital lobe, you've got what's called the primary visual cortex, which is on the very tip of the occipital lobe at the very, very back of your head. And then you've got the visual association area. And that is where we draw on memory to provide meaning to what we see. Okay, so it's a, it's a two stage event that takes place. This is why, and I don't know if any of you have ever been knocked out either on purpose or accidentally. I have, okay? But when you get knocked out, if you get hit on the button, right? Like right on the chin, or if you get hit on say the bridge of the nose, which is what happened to me, I took a hard ball on the bridge of the nose, your, your head will jerk back and then jerk forward, okay? And when it does that, the occipital lobe of your brain will bump against your occipital bone. You know, even though there's fluid and membranes around it, it'll, it'll bump that. And you will see visual images. And when this happened to me, I did see 
stars and planets, just like in the comic books. I saw little Saturns and little stars, and I thought, gee, I always thought that was something that the comic book people made up, but it's a real thing, okay? And the reason for that is that you're, you're, you're kind of bumping on the occipital lobe and you're creating nerve impulses that to your brain look a little bit like images, okay? All right, let's see, Olivia can come in. Hold on, Olivia, let me get the automatic out. Boom, boom, auto, okay, and admit, there we go. Okay, so we have some different tests that we can use for what are called errors of refraction, okay? Um, in myopia, what happens is that the, the image comes into focus in front of the retina. And so by the time it gets to the fovea, it's blurry, all right? Why does this happen? This can happen because your eyeball is too long, or it can happen because your cornea and your other transparent layers are, are such that the focal length is um, essentially too short, okay? So that you come into focus somewhere in the middle of the vitreous, all right? So what do we do about that? Well, the standard thing to do is to use a convex lens, all right? So a convex lens, let's draw that. Okay, uh, here we go. In a convex lens, right, what would happen is that we would, we would put lenses that are, um, I'm sorry, concave lens, my bad, concave lens. We use a concave lens. You will put lenses that are thin in the middle and thick on the rims in front of your eye, right? So now what happens, and we'll get a different color for the, for the light here. So here comes the light, right? And where normally, let's say you would focus your image, uh, you know, here, if you're nearsighted, what happens when a light ray hits a concave lens is that it bends out. And then it bends as it hits here in such a way that it's gonna come into focus not in the middle of the vitreous, but right on your fovea, okay? And then sometimes what'll happen is that your eye dimensions can change or your lens or your cornea can change a little bit and you have to change your prescription, okay? We can do contact lenses that do the same thing, all right? Or we can use laser corrective surgery in such a way that we can, um, we can make the cornea thin out so that you get the same effect as a concave lens does, okay? Now, in the event that you have, we can erase that, erase that. Let's say that you have hyperopia, right? And what's happening in hyperopia is that the image is coming into focus behind the retina, right? So you're getting a blurry image on the sweet spot, right? So the light rays are, they're coming like, they're coming like this, okay? Let's get rid of the, the concave lens there. Race this. Okay. Go away. There we go. Okay. So instead of instead of coming in and, and hitting the sweet spot like you want, it comes way out here and comes into focus, right? So what we do here is we give you lenses that are fat in the middle, they look like magnifying glasses. So take pen color white. So they'd be like this, okay? And what happens then is that when the light hits it, it bends more, okay? That shortens the focal length and it comes into focus right exactly and let's just have a new pen color here. Let's do green. It comes into focus exactly where we want. So we go here, we go here, we bend more, we bend more, and where we hit, we hit right where we want, okay? So hyperopia happens either because your eyeball is too short or the optical components of your eye are such that it focuses the image behind your retina. And we can also fix this with contact lenses or with laser corrective surgery 
which would cause the cornea to get a little bit fatter and bend the light more effectively so that it hits the retina. Okay, so that's hyperopia, nearsightedness, the opposite condition. And that's myopia. Okay, now one of the ways that we can check for myopia is the test that you do when you go get your driver's license, where they tell you to look in the little device and you read the letters, right? And that's telling you how your vision compares to normal vision, okay? So if you have 20-20 vision, that means that you see at 20 feet what a normal person sees at 20 feet, all right? If you have 20-40 vision, that means that you see at 20 feet what a normal person could see at 40 feet away. So your vision is compromised, okay? But you could also have very, very good vision, right? You could have say 40-20 vision, which says that you can see at 40 feet what a normal person could see at 20 feet away, okay? And those people are often picked to do things like a fly aircraft, okay? All right. So the next topic is gonna be the ear, okay? The ear and the vestibular apparatus are actually all in one organ, okay? The inner ear, the vestibule, and the semicircular canals are all connected to each other, right? Um, the, the inner ear portion that deals with hearing is called the cochlea, okay? The inner ear portion that deals with balance is the vestibule and the semicircular canals, all right? So let's take a look at what, what the mechanics of hearing are all about. Sound waves strike the tympanic membrane and cause it to vibrate. Vibration of the tympanic membrane causes the three bones of the middle ear to vibrate. The footplate of the stapes vibrates in the oval window. Vibration of the footplate causes the paralymph in the scala vestibuli to vibrate which in turn causes displacement of the basal or membrane. Short wavelengths from high pitch sounds cause displacement of the basal or membrane near the oval window. This movement is detected by hair cells of the spiral organ, which are not visible in the animation. Long wavelengths from low pitch sounds cause displacement of the basal or membrane far from the oval window. Again, this movement is detected by hair cells of the spiral organ, which are not visible in the animation. When the vibrations reach the paralymph in the scala tympani, they travel to the round window where they are dampened. So what you're seeing there is the, the first part of how the sound gets from your external ear, which runs from the part of the ear that you can grab on your head all the way through the external acoustic meatus, which is the hole in the temporal bone that goes all the way back to the eardrum, which is the tympanic membrane. And then from there to the ossicles, which are these guys, right? This is the malleus, this is the incus, this is the stapes. And that's gonna cause vibrations here that are gonna move a liquid called perilymph, all right? And that's going to move a liquid called endolymph, which is inside this little chamber, the cochlear duct. And that's going to cause a structure called the basilar membrane to vibrate. Okay. So what happens next? Well, let's see. If we go here. Sound waves. Sound waves are gathered by the pinna and directed down the auditory canal to the eardrum or tympanic membrane. The mechanical energy of the sound causes the eardrum to vibrate. This in turn causes vibration of the three middle ear bones. First the malleus, then the incus, and finally the stapes. These tiny bones amplify the vibrations. The stapes comes in contact with the inner ear at the oval window. The fluid filled inner ear is a coiled structure called the cochlea. Vibrations conveyed to the fluid cause bending of hair cells. If we examine this cross section of the cochlea, the tectorial membrane can be seen at the top. In it are embedded the tips of hair cells, which are shown circled in yellow. 
When the hair cells bend in response to vibration, the rate of firing by the neurons at their bases changes. These signals are conveyed to the brain and perceived as sound. And perceived. Okay, so what we see here, right, is that sound comes from an object, right? Sound is just basically molecules in the air smacking into each other. And that's called a pressure wave, okay? And there's areas of high and low pressure, right? And they're gonna funnel into the ear using the pinna like a funnel, okay? They're gonna do go down the external acoustic meatus. That's gonna cause the eardrum to vibrate. That's gonna make the malleus vibrate. That's gonna make the incus vibrate. And that's gonna make the stapes vibrate. And actually we can look here for this, okay? And then that's gonna make this contact between the stapes and the cochlea, which is this little membrane called the oval window, vibrate. And then that's gonna move the perilymph in the cochlea, which is gonna move the endolymph in the cochlea. And then it's gonna be like the last video showed you, right? The endolymph is gonna cause the basilar membrane to vibrate. And then the hair cells that sit on top of that are gonna bounce up and down and when they do, all right, they're going to hit the tectoral membrane right above them, and that's going to open up ion gates, and that's going to let potassium flow into those cells, and that's going to create a current, and ultimately that's going to be a nerve impulse that goes from the eighth cranial nerve, which is the vestibulocochlear nerve, back to a couple of places in the brain stem, and then to the thalamus, and then finally to the temporal lobe of the brain, okay? That is the nerve pathway. Now, there's a lot of things that can happen to mess with your ears, okay? One of the conditions you can get is something called otitis externa, which is sometimes called swimmer's ear. And what that is, is an inflammation, and let's get the laser pointer up here, of the external acoustic meatus, right? And what happens is it can swell and sometimes it can shut, okay? And it can be caused by toxins or bacteria. Basically, it's inflammation going on here. And what we usually do for that is we put a medicated wick with antibiotics in there and that reduces the swelling and that allows you to get sound waves back to the eardrum so you can hear again, okay? Another condition that can affect the ear is a condition called otitis media, all right? And we know otitis media, and any of you mothers with kids, maybe you've experienced this. In otitis media, what can happen, a couple things can happen, right? If, if you swim in dirty water, all right? Even though the water shouldn't, shouldn't get under your eardrum, it does, right? The dirty water can get back here and bacteria in the dirty water can begin to grow and then generate pressure that pushes on the eardrum and it hurts tremendously. You wish for death, it's so bad, okay? That's one way the bacteria can get in. The other way the bacteria can get in is through the eustachian tube, which in little kids is real short and straight and goes right to the throat, the nasopharynx, right? The top, the part of your throat that's right behind your nose. And what can happen is that bacteria in your throat, like when you have a sore throat or a cold, can make its way up into here and set up and do the same thing. Okay. And that produces gas and pressure and that can push out on the eardrum. And again, it's very painful. Okay. Um, so today, what do we do about it? Today, one of the standard treatments is just give you large amounts of antibiotics in order to try and kill the bacteria and reduce the pressure and reduce the pain. Now, sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. Okay. If it doesn't work, the unfortunate consequence is that the, the buildup in pressure can tear the, indra, the eardrum open from the inside out. Now that is very painful, but what'll happen at that point is that the liquid and the infection and the gas that's built up behind the drum will drain out at that point, okay? We call that superative liquid, okay? Let's change the color of the pen and let's make it, uh, I don't know, gray, because it's nasty. It's got all kinds of dead stuff and immune cells in it, it just drips out the air, okay? And then the pain's gone, which is good, but then the eardrum heals up and it's got scars all over it, 
and then that's going to reduce your ability to hear real well okay because the drum won't be as flexible okay in the old days what they would do is they would lance the drum okay so what is that that is where they put you down on a table and hold your head steady and then they would take a speculum which is you know the, the part of a let's do a draw the black the speculum is the part of the otoscope that looks into your ear that's shaped like a funnel okay so they would take that they would put that in your ear right there'd be a hole down here and another pair of speculum here and they would take a long needle right and they would punch a tiny hole in the drum and let it drain okay now you might think oh my goodness they're punching a hole in your eardrum well that's better than letting the eardrum tear open from the inside out okay what do we do long term for this well if this happens a lot in your kids one of the things they can do is put in what are called mirantogamy tubes tubes in the ears which is basically a plastic tube with a sleeve on either end you insert the tube into the drum it's like a permanent fixture and that the purpose of the tube is to relieve the pressure that can build up behind the drum so that in the event that you get an infection the pressure can be relieved okay now uh one of the old treatments also not a cure but basically a way to deal with the pain was a a compound called aralgin uh, a u r aralgin okay now in the old days this came in a dark blue dropper bottle and it was a very good topical anesthetic, right? So you would, you would warm it up under hot water and then you would take a drop or two of that and you would drop it on the drum and it would numb the drum long enough that you could sleep through the night and then you could get your kid to the doctor and then he could deal with it, okay? They still have a Ralgan around, but it's not quite the same formulation. It's a, a little bit less effective as a topical, but it's still worth using. The pain is really bad with otitis media, okay? So you, you got to feel for your, for your kids if they're suffering from this. If they're getting this because they're swimming in dirty water, which to be honest with you is any water, right? Swimming pool water has bacteria in it, just the same as a pond or a lake, is to wear earplugs. You can get them into your drugstore and they cut down on the amount of dirty water that can get into the ear and slide under the eardrum while you're swimming, but you can still hear with them in. Okay. So that's a, that's an important recommendation. Okay. Hey, okay, Mr. Converse. Yes, ma'am. Um, is swimmer's ear caused by the bacteria yes. in the water? Yes. So the swimmer's ear is the bacteria, but what it's doing is infecting and it's inflaming the canal instead of getting behind the drum and getting in the middle ear. Okay. So it's, okay. it's still, yeah, it's still a bacterial. It can be a fungal infection too. You can get fungus growing in your, in your, um, in your ear canal that can, in some cases, get all the way to your drum and eat it away. Okay, okay that's what I thought because I had swimmer's ear and I had it for about a whole year and like my I would be sleep and my ear would just leak out of nowhere and it smelled so bad. Oh, I know, I know that what's happening there is is bacteria is is killing tissue. That's why it smells like that. Right, it smells like something dead. Okay. Um, that's what the medicated wick is for. Yeah. And even if it's chlorinated, like I said, there's still bacteria in chlorinated water and they can still cause that kind of a problem. Another thing that can happen with your ear is, um, you can have what's called, um, conduction deafness. Okay. And in conduction deafness, what happens is that we have trouble getting the sound wave from the sound to the cochlea, okay? So in conduction deafness, and let's erase this other stuff. In conduction deafness, what happens is that, is that um, you have a problem from the pinna and it could be all the way to the ossicles, okay? So there we go. Get rid of that, get rid of that, get rid of this. There we go, that's better. And there we go, there we go. Okay, so in conduction deafness, 
what's going on is that there's a problem anywhere from here to here. Okay, so what kind of problems could those be? Could be swimmers here, right? If, you're, if your canal is inflamed and closed up, you're gonna have a tough time getting sound back there, right? It could be earwax buildup. You have so much earwax in there that you can't get the sound wave back to the drum. It could be a ruptured drum or a missing drum, okay? That happens. It can be the ossicles are damaged, all right? So any of that is conduction deafness. And we can test for that using a tuning fork and a couple of, of tests called the, bar, uh, uh, the, uh, the Rhine and the Weber test, okay? And those are kind of fun to do if you have a tuning fork. Um, and um, to fix it, all right, well, it depends on the cause, right? If it's earwax buildup, we can clear out the earwax, right? If it's swimmer's ear, we deal with the infection. If it's a damaged drum, like to the point where the drum is missing, we can get you a new drum even. We can do a drum transplant, okay? If the ossicles are messed up, we can even have put in artificial ossicles, which is pretty cool, okay? So we can deal with conductive deafness. Now, nerve deafness is a different thing. And let's use a different color here. Let's use, let's use gray, okay? Um, sensorineural deafness is anything from the cochlea back to the brain stem and the brain, okay? So from here on out, right? So what do we do about that? Well, believe it or not, we have a treatment for that now too, okay? It's called a cochlear implant. And what you do with a cochlear implant is it, it's kind of like a microphone and it screws into the mastoid process, which is the bump right behind your ear. And then they thread electrical leads into the cochlear branch of the vestibulocochlear nerve. And then you have to learn how to hear again, okay? Which can be a task, all right? Um, but basically it's a substitute for your cochlea. It was a controversial thing in the deaf community for a long time because a lot of people thought if you were deaf and you got a cochlear implant, got your hearing back, that you were betraying the deaf community, um, which invested a lot of time in education regarding sign language and reading lips and stuff like that. But um, over time, it's become more accepted, okay? Um, the cochlear implant is usually more successful in people who have had their hearing and lost it than in people who were born deaf. And the reason for that is that in people who are born deaf, the auditory association area is essentially empty of information. And so the first time you hear something, it's very frightening and can be painful. And it's difficult to understand that, that what you're hearing is language or sound because you've never experienced it before. Whereas in somebody who's had their hearing and lost it, you restore it with the cochlear implant they're more likely to be successful in terms of understanding sound and language and, and noise because the brain has those memories to draw on, okay? Yeah, the first time somebody who's born deaf gets a cochlear implant they hear, it's, it's scary for them, okay? They, they don't know what's happening to them in many cases. So those are, the, those are the things that can happen to the hearing apparatus in your ear, right? Um, the parts of the ear are the external ear, which includes the auricle and the external auditory canal, and it ends at the eardrum, right? The middle ear contains the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, and the eustachian tube that connects the middle ear to the throat. And then the inner ear is the cochlea, the vestibule, semicircular canals, and that's also where cranial nerve eight is attached, okay? Um, the eustachian tube, remember, is your, your pressure regulator right? And that makes it so that the tympanic membrane can vibrate when it hit, has a sound wave hit it, okay? In young children, it's short and horizontal, and that's why they're prone to otitis media. And in adults, it's longer and more vertical. So often we grow out of otitis media. Sometimes we don't. Getting otitis media as an adult is really awful, okay? Because it's, it's tough to relieve that pressure. Um, the uh, Again, the cause is usually um, bacteria that get in there from your throat to your eustachian tube to your ear, okay? Now, this is one of the reasons why, and I know this is going to sound strange, okay? 
but you shouldn't, when you have a cold, you shouldn't blow your nose real hard. And the reason is that the pressure can force the infected mucus up into the eustachian tube and into the middle ear, and that can cause otitis media. So instead of blowing your nose, what you wanna do is wipe it, okay? And that, that reduces the risk that you're gonna get something bad up into that middle ear. This is also why when you go up in an airplane or you go up in the mountains and you swallow, you can hear that clicking sound because that's a regulation of pressure that's going on between the middle ear and the external ear, okay? And eventually it resets so that you can hear at a high altitude, okay? All right, the organ of Corti is where we turn the pressure wave into electrical information, right? The canoreceptors in the cochlea of the middle ear um, are part of the organ of Corti, which is the, in the cochlear duct and it's bathed in endolymph, right? And it's the cochlear branch of the eighth cranial nerve that talks to it. And so again, what we're saying here, right, is that when the sound wave gets to the endolymph, which is what fills, this is the cochlear duct right here, right? That's where the endolymph is, so cochlear duct CD, okay? When the endolymph vibrates there, this membrane shakes up and down, and then these little hair cells, which are where the mechanoreceptors are on the top of them, they're, they're stereocilia, these little hairy extensions, they they deform, they bend when they hit the tectoral membrane and that opens those potassium gates. And that's what's gonna make the current ultimately that goes back the eighth cranial nerve and then back to the first, the brain stem and then the thalamus and then the temporal lobe of the brain, okay? So this is like a cross section through the cochlea, right? This would be filled with perilymph, okay? This is perilymph here. P-E-R-I, perilymph, okay, perilymph here, and also down here is perilymph, okay, all right, and an endolymph in the cochlear duct, which is high in potassium, okay, and so all of this is embedded in your temporal bone of your cranium, okay, so like this would be bone out here, this would be bone out here, and then perilymph, and then this is basically soft tissue, right? And that's where the endolymph is, all right? So when we hear, right, the pathway of sound is the sound waves go past the pinna, down the external acoustic meatus, they hit the tympanic membrane, that vibrates. The ossicles vibrate, the malleus, the incus, the stapes. The oval window vibrates. Then the perilymph vibrates. Then the endolymph vibrates and the basilar membrane vibrates, and then those hair cells vibrate, right? And then their little extensions hit that tectoral membrane and they open up those little potassium gates and that makes the potassium current happen. And then that goes from the organ of Corti to the cochlear branch of the eighth cranial nerve, and then back to the brainstem, the thalamus, and then the temporal lobe. That's the whole pathway. When hearing doesn't occur, what happens is that we have a problem, right? We have either conductive or sensory neural deafness, like we talked about earlier, right? So we either have a problem in conductive deafness from the pinna all the way to the ossicles, right? Which would be from here to here, right? Or in sensory neural deafness, we have a problem. Let's change colors again. Go green. We have a problem from the oval window back to the brain stem and even to the brain, okay? And the fixes for that are different depending on what the problem is, okay? So, um, and we talked about some of the problems that can occur. Now, one of the things that we also have to appreciate is that the cochlea and the vestibule and the semicircular canals are all attached to each other, okay? and they're all bathed in endolymph. So when we talk about balance, which is coming up next, it's the same basic idea, except where the cochlea responds to sound waves, 
the vestibule responds to gravity and the receptors in the semicircular canals respond to what we call angular movement, which is your body moving in a circle or in an arc, okay? But the mechanism is still the same. Fluid moves that causes the movement of hair cell extensions and that opens up ion gates and potassium goes in and that's what makes the current, okay? So sometimes what can happen if we have a pressure problem in the ear, like say otitis media, is that we can have a pressure problem in the cochlea, which can also cause a pressure problem in your balance apparatus. And you can end up not only with a problem hearing, but you can end up with a problem with your balance too, okay? And so usually to relieve that, we have to relieve what's causing the infection. So that could be a dose of antibiotics or in, 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 in some cases, they may still lance the drum, okay? All right, so balance. Balance is uh, our ability to stand up straight when we're either moving or when we're still, okay? So balance works as shown here. The ability to sense head position is achieved by monitoring sensory organs in the saccule and utricle of the inner ear called maculae. The hair cells in the macula are key to the vestibular sense. Each hair cell has a large cilium referred to as the kinocilium and many smaller cilia called stereocilium. When the cilia is bent towards the kinocilium, the firing rate of the hair cell decreases. Within the macula, the cells are embedded in a gelatinous layer that is weighted by otoliths. So the idea here, right, is that when you tilt your head, right, forward or side to side, right, gravity is going to pull on these otoliths, which are in this, this gelatinous matrix, okay? And that's going to pull on these stereocilia, and that's going to open up potassium gates, and that's what's going to generate now the current in the vestibular branch of the vestibulocochlear nerve that tells your body the position of your head when you're standing still, okay? So you've got a set of these on the left and on the right, okay? And when you, when you say bend to the right, the rate of firing will increase on the right, decrease on the left. And when you bend to the left, it'll be flipped the other way. So you've got maculae that are positioned at right angles to each other. You've got a vertical one and you've got a horizontal one. And so they can pick up tilt in the head at any angle, okay? And again, there's, there's endolymph all outside of this. And so the otoliths are there. This is the otolithic membrane to give a little weight to it so that when gravity pulls on it, it has more effect, okay? Now, this is what's called your static equilibrium, right? Your ability to remain upright or balanced when you're still, or when you're experiencing something called linear acceleration, which means changing your speed in one direction, okay? For angular acceleration, the semicircular canals are gonna do this. So. I've got a little video that kind of shows this. Uh, yeah, let's, let's uh, discard those. Okay. And uh, let me grab that. Uh, file open recent. And we want, we want, da 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 da. da. There we go. Okay. There we go. Now let's do a new share. And we want the vestibular system. We share that. Okay. So this is kind of cool. Sensation of angular movements of the head is due to the motion of a fluid called endolymph within the vestibular system. Located within the temporal bone is a negative space known as the inner ear. These interconnected canals make up the bony labyrinth of the vestibular system, the portion of the inner ear responsible for balance and the body's sense of position in space. The volume of the bony labyrinth is filled with a fluid called perilymph, which suspends the membranous labyrinth. This membranous labyrinth contains the fluid endolymph. 
The structure of the membranous labyrinth consists of three semicircular ducts positioned in three separate planes, anterior, posterior, and lateral. Each of the ducts has a widened space called an ampulla where it connects with the utricle. Within the ampulla is a sensory organ, the cristae ampullaris. When endolymph moves, it pushes the gelatinous copula that covers the cristae ampullaris, causing embedded hair cells to bend and send nerve impulses to the brain. Now we will examine the relative motion of endolymph to that of basic movements of the head. To increase clarity, spheres will be superimposed in the endolymph to help visualize motion of fluid. We will also only address movement within the left vestibular apparatus. First, let's view axial rotation. This movement will be best exemplified in the lateral semicircular duct. Note that the fluid does not move in sync with the labyrinth as the result of inertia. For flexion and extension of the head, the anterior duct is the most affected. To view endolymph motion in the posterior duct, we will show lateral bending of the head. As you can see, the flow of endolymph is an essential part of the body's sense of movement. So that's, that's our dynamic equilibrium, okay? Our dynamic equilibrium is our ability to stay upright and balanced when we're moving, okay? And so what's happening here is that endolymph is moving through these little semicircular canals, one or more, depending on how we're moving. And that endolymph is flowing past the cupula, right? Which is part of the crista ampullaris. This little thing looks like a cupcake. And that's bending those stereocilia on those hair cells and that's opening potassium gates and that's what makes the current that's going to be sent from the vestibular nerve, the, the vestibular branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve back to first the brain stem and also the cerebellum. And then it's also going to go to the thalamus and then to the, the vestibular cortex of the brain which is kind of an uh, area that's in dispute, but the research I've read says it's in a region called the operculum, which is basically the border between the temporal lobe and the parietal lobe of the brain, okay? So any problem with either the vestibule or the semicircular canals produces a condition known as vertigo, okay? Which is dizziness, basically, when you're doing any kind of movement or sometimes even when you're not moving at all, okay? So I have vertigo and it comes and goes. Um, I have a little touch of it like all the time, um, but sometimes it gets really bad, especially if I have an ear infection and it, the room will spin even when I'm not moving, okay? And that's, that's just a terrible feeling. And there's almost nothing that I can do about it other than close my eyes. Okay. And even then I feel like my head is swimming and it can be caused by um, inflammation in these little semicircular ducts. It can be caused by an ear infection where you've got pressure on the cochlea and that keeps the fluid from moving the way that it should. And it can even be caused by little crystals that can get in these, these ducts and block the flow of the fluid. Okay. 
And so the question is, what do you do about it? And there are exercises you can do in some cases if there's a blockage to help the fluid move and maybe dislodge those little crystals. If there's an ear infection, we can treat the ear infection. But sometimes, and this is really awful, we can't do anything about it. And then this really impacts your quality of life because you, you can't drive, you can't operate heavy machinery, you can't hardly do anything if you can't keep your balance, Al along with the fact that you run the danger of falling down all the time. And we don't have a substitute for the vestibular apparatus and the semicircular canals like we do for the cochlea, okay? There just isn't anything yet. So this is one of the reasons why, again, um, and all this is, in, again, embedded in your temporal bone, your inner ear apparatus is really important and information from that inner ear apparatus is used along with information from your muscles and joints and your eyes to tell the cerebellum that you're moving the way that you intend to move, okay? So that's how we help to coordinate our movement. So if you're missing a piece of that information and the cerebellum isn't working with good stuff, and so you end up with a problem with your balance, right? You may fall, you may trip, okay? And this happens a lot in older adults too, okay? For a couple of reasons. Their vestibular apparatus can um, get little crystals in it, right? And it can work not as well. The nerve connections between the eighth cranial nerve and the, and the central nervous system can be less effective. And the balance part of their brain may start to not work as well. And so they're more likely to fall down. And the reason that that's dangerous in older people is because um, their bones can be softer. And then instead of a bruise or a bump, they could have a fracture which will take a longer time to heal. So we really worry about um, falls in the elderly. This is one of the reasons why we recommend things like walkers and wheelchairs, but more importantly, we recommend at least half an hour of exercise to maintain muscle mass and bone density so that they have at least that benefit in the event that they do fall, their bones are less likely to crack. And if their muscles are stronger, they might be less likely to fall, okay? So if you're, if an elderly relative is not wanting to use their cane or their walker because it makes them look old, tell them it's for their own good, okay? It's to protect their health because if they fall, it can be bad news, okay? All right. Any so I got, Yeah. I have a question. You said that you have vertigo. Yes. When you have those spouts of vertigo, do you get um, like this tingling sensation? What, what happens when I get my vertigo is that my eyes start to track. So I'll be standing still and my eyes will start to roll in my head, okay? And I have it on one side worse than the other. Like if I lie down on my right side, I really do. But if I lie down on my left side, I don't. And that kind of tells me that there's something wrong with one or the other side, that it's not something that's in my brainstem. But I got it, the, the first real bad bout of it, I got while I was driving and I could barely keep the car in the road. I was, I was trying to drive in a straight line and the, the, the road was just flipping up and hit me in the, in the face. And I, I had to stop. And I told my wife, I said, this is terrible. I don't know what's going on, but I can't, I can't keep my balance. And I was, I was nauseous. I had to lie down for probably a good six, eight hours before it went away. And then they gave me some drugs that were for nausea and also to try and deal with the fluid in the ear. Um, a tingling sensation for me, not so much. It's, it's more of a, I could feel my eyes tracking, right? You, you know how... If, you, if you've ever been to a like a hockey game or a basketball game, one of the things they do is they do this whole thing where they call a couple of fans out of the audience and they get them, they give them a baseball bat and they put the baseball bat down on the ground. They put their head down on the baseball bat and they tell them to run around the baseball bat real quick. Right. And then when they say stop, they drop the bat and they try to walk back to their seat and they, they, they fall over. And the reason for that is that even though they're standing still, 
the fluid in their semicircular canals is still moving. And so to them, they're still spinning around. And so they flop right over. Well, in somebody with vertigo, it, it, that's kind of what's going on, is that you're getting fluid movement or lack of fluid movement that's telling your brain you're moving when you're not moving and you're more likely to flop and fall. So my I, mine was connected to an ear infection. And so they, they help deal with the ear infection, but I still have some residual vertigo um, like every day. Like when I put my head in a certain position, I'll, I'll feel it. You know, it'll, it'll, it'll swim and it'll trap. And that's well now, something. yeah, go ahead. Mine, I started having busy spells a couple of years back and I thought it was from a medication. I would get um, the dizzy spells and then I would feel like a tingling in my tongue. Mm -hmm. And then it would feel, taste kind of like a coppery taste. Okay, now that- And it went, it went away for a while, but here recently it's, it's come back. Okay, so that, that feels like an interaction of your medication with what your balance apparatus is telling your brain. And that can be an effect of certain meds, okay? Um, there are meds that can counteract that. And so what you wanna do is tell your doctor what's going on, okay? T tell them exactly what your symptoms are and then they can make them the medication adjustments so that you don't experience that anymore. What's important with that is to make sure to tell your doctor when it happens, what are you doing when it happens? Have you changed the medication? Have you not eaten for a while? How's your blood sugar level? Okay, one of the things that's, that can give you vertigo is a is a big drop in blood sugar. Okay, um, which can be related to um, it can be related to insulin problems. Okay, like diabetes. We'll talk about diabetes in the endocrine chapter here. Or it could. Be yeah, related. I'm pre-diabetic, so. Okay, okay, so it, it could also be related um, to just plain old not eating enough. Okay. There, there are people that get they get dizzy and kind of nauseous and fall over because they just they don't eat enough food. Um, and this is a big problem in the elderly too. One of the things that you'll notice if you have ever experienced elder care is that you have to remind a lot of older people to drink and to eat, okay? Because the the mechanisms that tell them they're thirsty and hungry don't work as well anymore, and that's real bad, right? If you if you're not drinking that's really gonna impact your health big time. Same as if you're not eating. The reason a lot of older people don't eat as much, A, they're not as active, but B, the food has lost its taste. And that's because their taste buds and their olfactory receptors have died. And so everything kind of tastes like wallpaper paste. And so eating's no fun, right? And the thirst mechanism breaking down, the, the way to tell that somebody's dehydrated, one of the easy ways, is to pinch the skin. And if the skin stays pinched after you pinch it, that's called tenting. And that means you need more water, okay? So that's a very important thing to, to, to keep your mind on as well. Yeah, so yeah, there's a lot of causes for dizziness. Um, vertigo is just the, the experience of that. And one of the things that can do that is messing up your vestibular apparatus. But, but definitely problems with blood sugar can also lead in many cases to vertigo as well. So very good question, very good question. All right, so let's take, let's take um, 10 minutes and use the restroom and get something to eat. And um, we'll come back and we'll deal with endocrine, okay?
Troy, what's up? So I just had a question and I lost it. Okay. <laughs> um, so like when we have our classes, you think we're going to like take it to one thirty each time or not? I don't know. It depends on how long the chapters are. Oh, oh yeah. I forgot about that. We're kind of buckling down here. Yeah. I mean, today we probably won't go quite as long, right? Because we're just doing two. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it, it all depends. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Mr. Converse? Yes, ma'am. Um, this is Morgan. Did you see that I was able to get in finally into the class? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm checking you guys out now. I'm doing... Okay. Uh, I'm, I don't know what happened because the code I was using, I just it was going to Miss Jackie's room, so I had yeah, to th yeah. I don't have a code. Uh, it's it's a different link, and um, you should just be able to just come right in. Okay. It, you just hit the link, the little web link in the invite, and it should just let you right in. I'll see you in the waiting room, and I'll just pop you right in. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what was going on this morning, but I had to like restart my computer, and then it finally let me on. But I wanted to make sure you knew I was in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see you. You're right, you're, thank you're good. You. You're good. Mm -hmm. da, 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 da.
All right. All right. We're back. Next topic is endocrine system, okay? Now, the endocrine system is like the body's other communication network, all right? The nervous system we've learned about, the endocrine system does a lot of the same stuff, but it uses different tools, okay? While the nervous system uses neurotransmitters and electrical current, to send stuff around the body and its effects are usually very targeted and very short lived. Okay. The endocrine system uses hormones, which are chemicals that are secreted into the blood and those travel to the tissues in the body where they attach to cells that have receptors for those particular hormones and can respond to them. Okay. And those are the only cells and tissues that will respond to those hormones or those that have receptors for those hormones. What happens after the hormone is released is that that cell or tissue, that target, is going to perform some activity. And then those conditions that are created will feed back to the original endocrine organ and turn down or turn off the secretion of that hormone. So it's a slower system, but it uses less energy and its targets are usually broader. And this is a solution to our body plan. Our body plan is such that if we were to hook every cell in the body up to the nervous system, we would be unimaginably large, okay? And in addition, we would consume tremendous amounts of energy. So that wouldn't be a practical way 
to design the body in order to maintain homeostasis. And what this does is this gets around that problem by providing a low tech version of what the nervous system is a high tech version of, okay? So we're gonna list the functions of the endocrine system and talk about what they do. We'll talk about hormones and what different types of hormones perform and different classes of hormones. And we'll also talk about how we control hormonal secretion, okay? And then we'll talk about the organs of the endocrine system. We'll talk about the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, the adrenal glands, the thyroid gland, the thymus, the gonads, okay? And then we might talk about some other tissues that are endocrine in function, but are not strictly endocrine organs, okay? So the endocrine system is a series of glands and hormones that regulate metabolism involving carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, okay? The nervous system communicates through electrical signals and nerve impulses, which communicate information rapidly and have short-term effects well, the endocrine system communicates through chemical signals called hormones. You can look at some of the differences and similarities in the nervous and the endocrine system in figure 14.1 on page 260 in your book, okay? These endocrine glands are distributed throughout the body and they are in most cases what are called ductless glands. Now, some of the endocrine organs are they, they sort of do two things at once. Some, some endocrine organs are both endocrine organs and exocrine organs. An exocrine organ is one that has uh, a, a, a pipe or a hose or a duct, if you, you know, whichever way, you know, a, a connection between the gland and the, the cavity of an organ, right? Or the surface of a tissue, okay? That's an exocrine. An endocrine is just going to produce its hormone and through membrane transport, put it right into the blood. So most endocrine organs are highly vascularized, have a lot of blood vessels in them, okay? Um, the nervous system and the endocrine system do share some structures, okay? And we should point them out, all right? The hypothalamus is a structure in the nervous system that controls the endocrine system. It does this by controlling the pituitary gland, which controls other endocrine organs, such as the thyroids, the gonads, okay, and the adrenal cortex, okay, as well as other tissues in the body. So the, the old name for the pituitary gland used to be the master gland, right? So the hypothalamus controls the pituitary and the hypothalamus is controlled by nerve impulses, okay? The adrenal glands down here above each kidney have two parts to them. There's an adrenal cortex, which is on the outside, and there's an adrenal medulla, which is in the core, okay? The adrenal medulla is actually neural tissue that's hooked directly up to the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system, okay? That's why when you freak out, not only does the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system fire more frequently, but you also release large amounts of adrenaline into the blood, okay? So <clears throat> your state of mind can affect the state of your endocrine system, which can affect your overall health, okay? Which is one of the reasons why some people um, like to use stress management as a way to make typical medical treatment more effective, okay? Your state of mind in some cases is just as important as your overall physical state, okay? And that's because of this mind-body connection between the nervous system and the endocrine system and the endocrine system and the rest of your body, all right? The thyroid gland is a butterfly-shaped gland in your neck that controls your metabolic rate, okay? And it also controls calcium levels in the blood. On the back of the thyroid gland are the parathyroid glands, 
which also control calcium levels. The thymus is where T cells, which are part of our immune system, mature and then move out to guard against pathogens in the body. And it secretes hormones that control the rate of production of these cells. The adrenal glands have a cortex and a medulla and the adrenal glands control the fight or flight response that's in the medulla. And then in the cortex, they control things like salt and fluid balance, sugar balance in the blood, inflammation, and they're also a source of sex hormones, like um, things that are similar to testosterone. The pancreas is a sort of a double gland, all right? It is both an endocrine gland and an exocrine gland. Its endocrine function is to secrete insulin and glucagon to control blood sugar, and its exocrine function is to secrete enzymes that help break down the food that we eat in the digestive system, okay? So it's two glands in one. The gonads in females, those are the ovaries, and in men, those are the testes, are also double glands, right? The ovaries and the testes produce gametes, right? The ovaries make eggs and the testes make sperm, and those go through a duct to eventually uh, an opening inside of an organ, okay? But they're also endocrine organs because they produce the sex hormones, estrogen, testosterone, and progesterone, okay? Men and women make all three, but men make more testosterone than estrogen and progesterone, and women make more estrogen and progesterone than they do testosterone, okay? And the control system really is from the hypothalamus on down, right? The hypothalamus is like the overlord, and then the pituitary gland is like the five-star general, and then these guys down here would be like the lieutenants, right? They would carry out the production of the chemical signals that talk to the rest of the body, okay? So that's, that's generally the case for the thyroid, pituitary, hypothalamus, gonads, and adrenal cortex, right? The pancreas and the thymus, okay, kind of work a little bit differently, okay? And we'll talk about what turns them on and off as well. Hormones are chemical messengers that are going to influence or control activities of target tissues that have receptors on their surface, or in some cases, inside the cells for those particular hormones, okay? So we can class hormones as either water-soluble or lipid-soluble, okay? The water-soluble hormones are proteins or in some cases, amino acid derivatives, meaning an amino acid that has been changed a little bit. And the lipid soluble hormones are the steroid hormones and a hormone called T3 and T4, which are thyroxin and another hormone called triiodothyroidine, okay? The lipid soluble hormones work a little differently on their targets than the water-soluble hormones do. And we'll talk about what those differences are, okay? You can have more than one target tissue for a hormone. The only thing that defines whether a tissue is a target for a hormone is whether it has the receptor for it, okay? So the gland is gonna aim its hormone at the target organ, okay? The target organ is defined as one that has receptors for the hormone and then the hormone is going to activate the receptors, which are either be, going to be on the cell membrane surface, if you're talking about a water-soluble hormone, such as a protein or an amino acid derivative, or inside the cell in the case of a lipid-soluble hormone, like a steroid hormone or a thyroxin or T3, okay? So how do those differences work? Well, if we're talking about a, a water-soluble hormone, right, the hormone's going to bind a receptor on the surface, and that's going to trigger that receptor to make a chemical inside the cell <coughs> that's called a second messenger. Sometimes 
That's a molecule called cyclic AMP. Sometimes it's something else, okay? And then that second messenger is going to activate other protein targets. They will activate other protein targets and eventually that's going to result in whatever it is we wanted the cell to do, okay? Whereas in a lipid soluble hormone, like a steroid hormone, you'll pass right through the membrane and then the receptor is actually in the cytoplasm of the cell or sometimes in the nucleus. What they'll do is they'll get together and then they'll cling to an area of the DNA on a gene called a promoter and they'll turn that gene on or they'll turn it off or they'll turn it up or turn it down. And that'll make messenger RNA and that'll be used to translate into a protein. And that's what we wanted the cell to do. So this takes longer to happen, okay? So steroid hormones and thyroid hormone do this. Everybody else works this way. Now this way is very rapid. And the reason for that is that this is an example of something called a cascade, okay? In a cascade, what happens, let's get pen out, right? Is that we have some initial event like the hormone binding to his receptor, right? So let's put his receptor here. And then there's the rest of the receptor and he goes in here, okay? Put him down here. And then we'll pick a different color, make this fun. Uh, let's do gray. And then what he'll do is he'll activate something, like let's say he'll take ATP to cyclic AMP, okay? Okay. And then the cyclic AMP will activate an enzyme like a kinase. So we'll call this, call this enzyme A and the activated is A star, right? And then we might have B going to B star and so on, right? And then finally we get to the deal, which is the activation of the target that we wanted to do the job, right? And you might think, well, this, and then see, this would be the membrane here. Let's draw the membrane in black. There's black. So this would be the cell membrane here. Okay. And all this is going on inside the cell. So you might think, well, this is an awfully complicated way to get a target to do something. And the reason that this is used, this cascade effect is used is because at every step in the cascade, everything gets amplified. I see a question from Troy. Troy, what's up? Oh, I don't have a question. Oh, okay, you had your hand up. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so why do we do this? Well, because at each step in the, in the pathway, it's not just a one-to-one -one deal, right? This activated receptor can make several cyclic AMPs, which can activate several of these A targets, and these A targets can activate several of these B targets. And so what happens at each step in the cascade is that the strength of the signal increases geometrically, right? It gets huge, right? So these guys branch, and they branch more, and you get this huge gigantic signal, right? Which is really cool because that means that the effect is going to be really fast, okay? So you can take a tiny event and magnify it many, many times. It's kind of like a reverse freeze tag. I like to think of the, if you used to play freeze tag when you were young, right? In freeze tag, you would have somebody who was it, right? And then they would, anybody that they touched had to freeze, right? And when you froze everybody you want. Well, in reverse freeze tag, think of it this way, right? Somebody is it and everybody they touch is it and everybody they touch is it and pretty soon everyone's it, right? kind of like a pandemic. Well, the same thing's going on here, right? You activate, you activate more, you activate even more, and then pretty soon you get this big response from your target. And then once that happens and the hormone quits attaching up here to its signal, then we cut off all this activation. The waterfall, basically, the cascade stops. And then there's enzymes hanging around inside the cell that can basically unactivate all this stuff real quick. So not only do you magnify the signal big time, but it's also easy to control, okay? So that's why cascades exist. 
These are cascades that happen inside cells. There are cascades that happen outside cells, like the blood clotting cascade, okay, is one example. So that's why it's designed that way, okay, to happen like that. Okay. All right. The way that we control how hormones work is through either negative or positive feedbacks, okay? There are also biorhythmic control, all right, which relies on the state of the body. And then there's central nervous system control, all right? Another way to say this is neural control, humoral control, and hormonal control, all right? So in neural control, a nerve signal makes the gland click on or click off. In hormonal control, another hormone makes the endocrine gland click on or click off. And in humoral control, changes in the blood chemistry make the gland click on or click off, okay? One example we could take would be blood sugar, okay? When you eat a meal, one of the things you absorb from that meal into the blood is sugar, glucose. The glucose in the blood, the levels begin to rise and an organ called the pancreas has cells in there that see that. Those cells will then secrete a hormone that's called insulin. The insulin in the blood is a chemical signal that tells cells in the body to pull the sugar out of the blood and use it for energy. And it also tells the liver to pull the sugar out of the blood and use it to make fat or glycogen. And what happens then is that the blood sugar levels begin to fall. And the result then is that we go back to our normal blood sugar levels. The insulin production from the pancreas doesn't shut off, but it goes down, right? And then we wait until there's another change in blood sugar, right? If the blood sugar levels fall too low, then the, the uh, pancreas can produce a hormone it's called glucagon. And what glucagon does is it tells the liver to put sugar into the blood between meals, right? And so it tells the liver to break down fat, turn that into sugar, load that into the blood. And it tells the liver to tear up glycogen, make that into glucose and put that into the blood and the blood sugar levels go back up, okay? So the blood sugar levels basically um, go up and down between a window that keeps you healthy and happy, all right? If your blood sugar gets too low, that's a condition called hypoglycemia, right? And if they get too high, that's a condition called hyperglycemia. And neither of those are good, okay? Hypoglycemia is a problem in people that produce too much insulin or just don't have enough sugar in their body, okay? Or it can be a problem with a hormone called cortisol, whereas um, hyperglycemia, can be a problem in diabetics, okay? Now, um, if we look at positive control, you're looking at something else, right? For the mothers in the class, you've experienced positive feedback, okay? One of the ways positive feedback works is that when your, your baby is getting ready to be born, what he's gonna do is he's gonna start to crown right? He's going to push his head against your cervix and the cervix is going to start to stretch. And when that happens, those nerve signals are going to go to the hypothalamus of the brain, which is going to tell the posterior pituitary gland to produce oxytocin. And the oxytocin in the blood is going to basically find the uterus and cause it to squeeze. And the result is that more of the baby is going to come out more of the cervix is going to be stretched, more nerve signals are going to go back to the hypothalamus and more oxytocin is going to be made. And that'll repeat and repeat and repeat until the baby's born. And at that point, everything stops, okay? So there's only a few examples in the body of positive feedback, right? Most hormonal secretion works by negative feedback. And the whole idea behind negative feedback is you don't want to give a command that you don't need. Because if you do, you're essentially wasting resources and time and you're making the body sick, okay? So let's take a look 
at some positive and negative feedback loops in the body. During the menstrual cycle, before ovulation, small amounts of estrogen are secreted from the ovary. Estrogen stimulates the release of gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus and luteinizing hormone from the anterior pituitary. Gonadotropin releasing hormone also stimulates release of luteinizing hormone from the anterior pituitary. Luteinizing hormone in turn causes release of additional estrogen from the ovary. The levels of gonadotropin releasing hormone and luteinizing hormone increase in the blood due to this positive feedback effect. After ovulation, the corpus luteum is formed in the ovary and begins to secrete progesterone in response to luteinizing hormone. Progesterone inhibits the release of gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus and luteinizing hormone from the anterior pituitary. Blood levels of gonadotropin releasing hormone and luteinizing hormone decrease because of this negative feedback effect. So this is one of the ways that we control ovulation, right? If you have an implant in the uterus, right? A developing embryo, which, which can become a fetus and then a neonate and a baby, right? We don't want to release another egg from the ovary, which could become fertilized and implant because then it would be behind in development. And when the first baby was ready to be born, that would destroy the second baby because one of the things that happens when the baby's born is that we also lose the endometrium, which is the nutrient layer of the uterus that keeps the baby alive, okay? And so this prevents that from occurring, right? So positive feedback, negative feedback. Same thing is true with things like blood sugar, right? We didn't have negative feedback if we had, say, a rise in our blood sugar levels and that caused insulin production and then the insulin just stayed on, right? Then what would happen is that our blood sugar levels would start to fall so low that we would essentially probably pass out, maybe even go into a coma because of the effects of hypoglycemia, right? So this is what prevents those kinds of things from happening. The hypothalamus is going to control pituitary function. It's connected to the anterior pituitary through a capillary network called the hypothalamic hypophysial portal system. And it's connected to the posterior pituitary directly, okay? through secretory neurons. So what does the pituitary do, right? Well, the anterior pituitary, which is the adenohypothesis, makes growth hormone. It makes um, thyroid stimulating hormone. It makes luteinizing hormone. It makes um, it makes adrenocorticotrophic hormone. It makes follicle stimulating hormone and it makes prolactin, all right? And all of those have their targets, right? And those are actually manufactured within the anterior pituitary. The posterior pituitary is gonna release oxytocin and vasopressin, okay? Um, which are actually made in the hypothalamus, right? Oxytocin promotes uterine contraction and milk release, right? And then vasopressin also goes by the name of antidiuretic hormone. And its job is to cause you to retain more water in order to aid your fluent balance, okay? So in the hypothalamus, the way that we control the release of tissue from the pituitary gland is through releasing and inhibiting hormones, okay? The hypothalamus will send those through the blood vessels that are connected to the anterior pituitary and either increase or decrease 
the amount of hormone the anterior pituitary kicks out, right? Whereas in the posterior pituitary, the hypothalamus manufactures the hormone and it stores it in the posterior pituitary waiting for um, nerve signals to release it, all right? So what do each one of these do, right? Let's go down them one by one, okay? We'll go, we'll go laser pointer, right? Thyroid stimulating hormone. Well, the name kind of tells you what it does. It makes the thyroid make its hormone, right? So thyroid stimulating hormone causes the production of T3 and T4, okay? Triiodothyrodine is abbreviated T3 and T4 is thyroxin, okay? And as you can guess, they both have iodine in them. So where do we get the iodine to make these hormones? And the answer is from our table salt, right? And so we have to thank Morton's for that. Before we had iodized salt, we often had a problem with an underactive thyroid, right? And that would cause us to gain weight, um, have, a, have a lower body temperature and have a low metabolism, okay? So um, what would happen to the thyroid gland as a result is that it would grow. It would, it, would, um, it would enlarge forming something called a goiter under the chin, okay? And that reflects the fact that the pituitary gland was releasing thyrotropin releasing hormone, TRH, in an effort to try and turn on the thyroid gland and it wasn't working. So the hypothalamus kept pounding on the pituitary, the pituitary couldn't meet the demand. And so it got overstimulated, but it didn't make any hormone. And so it would increase in size, okay? Adrenocorticotrophic hormone targets the adrenal cortex and causes it to release hormones like cortisone and cortisol, and then also small amounts of a hormone called aldosterone. Okay. Gonadotropins are FSH and LH, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Now in women, follicle stimulating hormone stimulates follicles. And you might think, well, what are follicles? Follicles are little chambers in the ovary that contain eggs. Okay. And so it makes those follicles mature and helps them to get to the point where they can release their eggs. And that's a pro process called ovulation. Luteinizing hormone causes the remaining follicle cells that are in the ovary after the egg is popped out to become a temporary endocrine organ called the corpus luteum, which means yellow body. And what it does is it secretes large amounts of progesterone and a little bit of estrogen in an effort to maintain the endometrium, right? And also to suppress ovulation so that you don't pop another egg while you've got one fertilized and implanted in the uterus. In guys, uh, luteinizing hormone is gonna promote the production of testosterone and follicle stimulating hormone is gonna promote the production or something called androgen binding hormone, which concentrates the testosterone near what are gonna be the, eventually the sperm cells in the testes and causes the production of sperm to increase, okay? And then prolactin in women causes milk production. In men, we don't quite know what prolactin does, but men make it, so it must do something, okay. In the posterior pituitary, antidiuretic hormone, okay? Uh, drugs that make you pee, those are called diuretics, okay? And drugs that keep you from peeing are called antidiuretics, right? So antidiuretic hormone is gonna cause the kidneys to hold on to more water. And as a result, or it's gonna increase your blood volume and your blood pressure and also reduce your urine volume. Oxytocin is going to promote milk release and birth, okay? So it basically acts on smooth muscle. Now, kind of a, a funny story, okay? 
And this is why spelling is so important, right? Uh, let's get the pen out, right? Uh, a few years ago, um, there was a break-in at a local pharmacy and they stole large amounts of oxytocin to give to their clients. Hmm. Did they mean to do that? The answer is no. They weren't good with their spelling. What they were really looking for is a different drug, a painkiller called OxyContin, right? Yeah. So all they did was give their customers cramps. There you go, right? Spelling matters. It matters in documentation, it matters in, in many professions. Oxycontin, that should be an N there. Eraser. Boop. And pen. There you go. Oxycontin. Painkiller, right? Oxytocin also promotes emotional bonding between mother and child, right? That's why um, holding the child is, is good for the child and the mother because it promotes oxytocin release. It also works with your pets, right? You, you cuddle your dog, you pet your dog. Uh, oxytocin release helps their behavior and it helps your behavior, right? Okay. All right, there's a tiny third lobe and uh, it produces a hormone called melanocyte secreting hormone, okay? Adult cells make a polypeptide called propylmelanocortin, all right? Um, the third lobe cells are eventually incorporated into the anterior pituitary and so the adult pituitary has no tiny third lobe. The polypeptide that it produces is degraded in the pituitary gland to produce adrenocorticotrophic hormone and another compound that's called endorphins, okay? Now, what are endorphins? Endorphins are like the body's own painkiller, okay? So what they do is they act on receptors that opioids would act on. All right, and they reduce the pain signal getting up to the brain. Okay. All right, we're going to ID the endocrine glands, talk about their hormones and what they do. Okay, so if we look at your thyroid gland, your thyroid glands in the front of your neck, right under your thyroid cartilage, and guys, that's a near a little bump called the Adam's apple. Okay, and the follicular cells secrete T3 and T4 into something called colloid for storage. Well, what is colloid? It's, a, it's an acellular uh, material, right? It's not living material. Um, and it basically is, is lipid soluble polymer of these hormones um, connected one to the other to the other, okay? So T3 and T4 are actually derived from amino acids, right? And then we can hook those amino acids together and form the material of the colloid, right? Follicle stimulating hormone releases T3 and T4 into the blood, okay? Not follicle stimulating hormone. Let's, let's fix that immediately. Hold on. Should be thyroid stimulating hormone. So let's make that correction right now. There you go. That's better. Thyroid stimulating hormone causes the release of T3 and T4 into the blood by breaking down this polymer that's in the colloid. Okay. And thyroid stimulating hormone is coming from the anterior pituitary. And thyroid stimulating hormone release is controlled by TRH, which is coming from the hypothalamus. So TRH to TSH to T3 and T4. The parafollicular cells make calcitonin, which is a hormone that lowers blood calcium levels and makes bones denser. Okay, so um, it deals with, with calcium levels in the blood and it deals with 
your metabolic rate, right? The effect of T3 and T4 is to cause us to burn fat more quickly. And so it elevates body temperature and it um, reduces our fat content, all right? It also allows proper functioning of other hormones, promotes normal maturation of the nervous system and promotes no normal growth and development, okay? Consequences of too little thyroid hormone, constipation, bradycardia, which is a slow heart rate, right? Lack of energy and weight gain, okay? Um, a hypersecretion of thyroid hormone causes a reduction in fat content in the body, a sped up metabolism, an increase in body temperature, and an unusual condition known as exophthalmia, where the eyes bulge out of the head, okay? Um, you maybe have run into people that have a hyperactive thyroid. In either case, in either a hypoactive or a hyperactive thyroid, the thyroid gland will be enlarged and you'll have a goiter under the chin. In the case of a hypoactive thyroid, that's because the TSH isn't having the effect it wants. You're not making T3 and T4 hormone, okay? In the case of um, a hyperactive thyroid, it is producing the hormone, but it's, it's working real hard, right? And so it, it, it increases in size. So what do we do about that? Well, for a, a less active um, thyroid gland, we give you thyroid hormone, okay? If that's the problem. Now, the, the problem in determining what's going on with your thyroid has to do with the fact that there are really three glands involved, right? There's your hypothalamus, there's your pituitary and your thyroid gland. So if your thyroid gland is working, all right, it could be for several reasons, okay? The thyroid gland itself could be messed up or the thyroid gland could be missing one of the building blocks of thyroid hormone or your pituitary could be messed up, not giving enough TSH stimulation or your hypothalamus could be messed up and not giving enough TRH, all right? So it all depends on which organ is misbehaving, okay? Um, if we do a blood test and we find that your T3 and T4 levels are low and your TSH levels are low, then we think your hypothalamus is gonna be the problem, all right? If we see that your T3 and T4 levels are low, but your TSH and TRH levels are high, then probably your thyroid has got some sort of a problem, okay? And if we see that all three are low, then it's likely that the hypothalamus at the top of the command chain is what's wrong, okay? In any case, we can give you thyroid hormone, right? In a hyperactive thyroid, what's happening is you're making too much T3 and T4. And that could either be from overproduction of TSH or overproduction of TRH, right? Or it could be that the gland itself has become cancerous and is overproducing T3 and T4, or a condition such as Graves' disease has set in where you've generated autoantibodies that latch onto the gland and keep it in the on position and it overproduces T3 and T4. So we have to determine the cause in order to treat, okay? If it's Graves' disease, then we have to do something about your immune system. If it's cancer, we have to remove that part of the organ or maybe the whole organ, okay? And if it's your anterior pituitary, um, likely what we'll do is give you drugs that counteract the effect of TSH. And if it's your hypothalamus, we'll probably give you drugs that counteract TSH and maybe drugs that counteract TRH, right? So again, too much or too little, not a good condition, okay? The calcitonin is most important in early growth for um, essentially lowering 
blood calcium levels and mineralizing bone along with vitamin D, okay? So the way I remember that is calcitonin puts the tone in the bone, okay? All right, so that's hypothyroidism, right? Too little T3 and T4, hyperthyroidism, too much T3 or T4, okay? If we lack T3 and T4 during development, then we can develop a condition called cretinism, where the child is short, um, has a distended abdomen, and has cognitive deficit, okay? And unfortunately, there's not a lot we can do about it after the fact. We can give thyroid hormone after they're born, but the effects on the nervous system are gonna be tough to counteract, okay? And that can, that can sometimes um, be the result either of a developmental defect in the baby, or it could be the result of a reduction of T3 and T4 in the mother, because the T3 and T4 can cross the placenta, okay, and get into the baby's blood. So this is how it's all controlled, right? We start off in the control loop with a, let's put a laser pointer here. Let's say a reduction in T3 and T4, right? So that tells the hypothalamus, because that's what the hypothalamus picks up on, to kick out TRH, which hits the anterior pituitary, and that kicks out TSH, and that hits the thyroid, and that kicks out T3 and T4, which feed back and inhibit the anterior pituitary and hypothalamus. And so those command hormones start to reduce in levels in the blood, okay? Until what? Well, until the T3 and T4 levels fall again, and then we start up, okay? So this is an example of hormonal control, okay? One hormone is controlling the release of another hormone, okay? And this whole setup is the result of the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis. We need iodine to make T3 and T4. We get it in our salt, okay? And an iodine deficiency is gonna cause goiter and a less than effective thyroid, right? Um, so what'll happen is you'll gain weight, you get a goiter and your temperature will go down, okay? And um, you'll start to put on weight, okay? Your metabolism will drop as well. You see a lot of goiter in, in, um, in other countries that, that don't have iodized salt, okay, as a condiment. So that's one of the reasons why frequently in, in some third world countries, you'll see a higher incidence of goiter, all right? Now the parathyroid glands release a hormone called parathyroid hormone. And what does parathyroid hormone do? It elevates calcium levels in the blood by doing several things. It demineralizes bone, okay? So it breaks down bone through osteoclast activity, puts calcium in the blood. It increases calcium absorption from the intestines and it increases calcium retention by the kidneys, all right? So parathyroid does all of that. Calcium levels are really important, not just for bone structure, okay? Remember that calcium is critical in nerve transmission and muscle contraction, just to name a few. It's also important in cell transport in a lot of other tissues. So if you mess up your calcium levels, you're gonna have, among other things, cardiac problems, nerve problems, muscle problems, okay? Which is why a change in calcium levels is, is dangerous, right? If you have high calcium levels, that's a condition called hypercalcemia, okay? And the mnemonic for that is stones, bones, groans, thrones, and psychiatric overtones, okay? So let's, uh, let's caption that. Stones, bones, thrones, groans, and psychiatric overtones. Okay, now what does that mean? Well, Stones, kidney stones, 
which are usually calcium crystals. Bones, bone pain. Thrones, polyuria, meaning you're peeing all the time. Psych psychiatric overtones. Stress as a result, stress and depression as a result of your condition, okay? So that's a way to remember that. Now, for um, hypocalcemia, the mnemonic is cats go numb. Meaning what? Well, cat stands for convulsions, arrhythmia, tetany, and numbness and tingling. Okay. So a way to remember those conditions. All right. And those are electrolyte imbalances. Okay. Another thing you'll see with hypercalcemia or excess parathyroid hormone production is early onset osteoporosis, meaning your bones will fracture more easily because you're pulling too much calcium out of them. Okay. All right. So the three mechanisms of raising blood calcium shown here, right? And so what happens once the calcium levels get back up is normally the parathyroid hormone levels go down. And that's an example of humoral control, right? The blood chemistry is telling the parathyroid cells to cut it out, right? But if you get a tumor on your parathyroid and it goes nuts making a lot of PTH, then you're gonna have hypercalcemia, stones, bones, thrones, and psychiatric overtones, okay? And really the only fix for it is to remove the offending gland, right, through surgery. Thyroid gland secretes calcitonin when blood calcium levels get too high. Calcitonin lowers the calcium level by stimulating osteoblasts and that increases bone density and by telling the kidney to excrete more calcium, right? Hyposecretion of parathyroid hormone, meaning too little, right? So here we go, tetany causing carpal spasm, okay? That's the cats go numb, right? part of it. Hypersecretion, hypercalcemia, and there we are, stones, bones, groans, and psychiatric overtones, okay? So there it is. Your adrenal glands are really two glands in one, right? Your adrenal glands are made up of a medulla, which is actually neurosecretory tissue, and a cortex, which is glandular tissue, okay? The neurosecretory tissue kicks out adrenaline, also known as epinephrine, and the cortex produces hormones that control salt balance and fluid balance, control blood sugar and inflammation, and also have an impact on the reproductive system, okay? Um, those are aldosterone, cortisone and cortisol, and sex steroids, such as testosterone, okay? Figure 14.8 on page 272 will tell you about that, okay? The medulla is an extension of the fight or flight response, okay? So what happens when you freak out is the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system kicks out adrenaline, the adrenaline hits its targets, okay? And in addition, you stimulate the adrenal medulla to spill adrenaline into the blood. And the result is what? Increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, increased blood sugar, increased sweat production, dilation of the pupils, decreased GI, urinary and reproductive activity, okay? And increased blood flow to heart, lungs and skeletal muscle, right? And all of that's designed to do what? Get you ready to fight or run away, okay? And it takes a longer time to make a, a stress condition go away because the, um, the, the breakdown of epinephrine takes longer than the breakdown of something like acetylcholine, okay? The catecholamines produced by the medulla are epinephrine and norepinephrine. Their effects are very similar, okay? And remember that they also double as neurotransmitters, right? A tumor on the adrenal medulla is called a pheo chromocytoma, okay? The effects are basically hypertension, increased sweat production, 
increased blood sugar, okay, elevated heart rate, um, and we detect it through doing a urine test, okay? So yeah, you can get tumors in, in any of these. The adrenal cortex produces glucocorticoids, which control blood sugar levels. Cortisone and cortisol elevate blood sugar levels and also suppress information or suppress inflammation, sorry. So sometimes we use cortisone and cortisol medically to reduce inflammation in diseases where there's a lot of pain and inflammation going on. The problem with it is that extended use can suppress your immune system and screw up your blood sugar, okay? And it can produce a condition called iatrogenic Cushing's disease, okay? Iatrogenic means caused by the treatment and Cushing's disease, you typically see um, a person with a very round torso and a round and swollen face and then fat deposits on the back, okay? Mineralocorticoids include aldosterone, which causes us to retain more sodium, but also retain more water. So that raises blood pressure and blood volume, okay? And then we also produce sex steroids, testosterone being the most important. So one of the ways to remember the, the steroid hormone effects in the cortex is to remember the phrase salt, sugar, sex, okay? Which are what the effects are from the outside of the cortex to the interior of the cortex, right? Aldosterone on the surface of the cortex, cortisone and cortisol from the middle of the cortex, and testosterone and other sex hormones from the bottom of the cortex. The glucocorticoids are gonna convert amino acids into glucose and aid in a process called gluconeogenesis, which helps to maintain blood glucose levels between meals. It also has an impact on protein and fat metabolism, burning both substances as fuel to increase energy production, okay? But it also suppresses inflammation, okay? The chief mineralocorticoid is aldosterone, causes us to retain sodium, secrete potassium, and retain water, all right? Main target is the kidney. So it elevates our blood pressure and our blood volume, and it reduces our urine output. Sex hormones are estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone, okay? And hormones that are similar, right? But to be sure, right, the levels produced by the adrenal cortex aren't anywhere near the levels that are produced by your gonads. Your gonads make way more, okay? Hyposecretion of these corticoids can cause conditions such as Addison's disease, okay? Um, what happens here is that cortisol, aldosterone, and testosterone are under-secreted Okay, and so you can have low blood sugar, you can have inflammation, and you have a bronzing of the skin. It's thought that President Kennedy had Addison's disease. Okay, hypersecretion causes a condition known as Cushing syndrome. Okay, and so what happens there is you gain weight, you end up with increased blood sugar levels, and you end up with a decrease in um, decrease in fluid retention. Okay, a patient with Cushing syndrome is going to have that swollen appearance because cortisol causes a redistribution of fat and a retention of fluid. Right, your blood sugar levels go up. You're going to hold on to more fluid because the sugar in your blood is going to pull water to it because of osmosis. Okay. The pancreas is an organ that lies behind your stomach and between your small intestine and your spleen, right under the diaphragm. And the endocrine pancreas has structures in the tissue called islets of Langerhans, which contain alpha cells that make glucagon, which raise blood sugar levels, and beta cells that make insulin, which lower blood sugar levels, okay? 
it also produces enzymes that aid in the breakdown of the food that we eat. But it's not the islet cells that do that, it's the acinar cells, right? So it's one organ that has a couple of different jobs, okay? Figure 14.9 shows how the pancreas regulates blood glucose levels. We basically already discussed this in that when blood sugar levels rise, the pancreas kicks out insulin, okay? And the insulin is gonna cause the blood sugar levels to drop, all right, by telling cells to pull the sugar out of the blood and use it for fuel and telling cells to, um, in the liver, to take that glucose and make fat and glycogen out of it. And when blood glucose levels fall, the pancreas secretes glucagon, which tells the liver to release sugar into the blood, okay? And so that's what keeps our blood sugar levels within an acceptable range, okay? In normal metabolism, carbohydrates are energy molecules, right? And the insulin causes increased transport of these energy molecules into the cell and also storage of the glucose as glycogen or fat. It also stimulates protein synthesis, so it has an anabolic effect and it stimulates fatty acid production, okay? Um, so what can happen if we have a problem in either insulin production or insulin sensitivity? And the answer to that is a condition known as diabetes. So let's take a look. Diabetes mellitus is a complex disorder of metabolism. It is a disease in which the body does not produce or properly use insulin. Insulin is a hormone that is needed to convert sugar, starches, and other food into energy needed for daily life. There are two types of diabetes that affect the elderly. Type 1 diabetes, also known as insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, IDDM, or juvenile onset diabetes, results from the body's failure to produce insulin. An individual with type 1 diabetes needs to take daily insulin injections for the rest of their lives. It is estimated that 850,000 to 1.5 million Americans have type 1 diabetes. Non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus or adult onset diabetes results from insulin resistance combined with relative insulin deficiency. Approximately 16 million Americans have type 2 diabetes. Someone with type 2 diabetes might make healthy or even high levels of insulin, but obesity makes the body resistant to its effect. Exercising 30 minutes a day and maintaining proper body weight for age and body type can help prevent type 2 diabetes. Pre-diabetes occurs when a person's blood glucose levels are higher than normal, but not high enough for a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. Without lifestyle changes, most people who have pre-diabetes will progress to type 2 diabetes within 10 years. The diagnosis of DM can shorten the average lifespan by up to 15 years. By 2025, over 20 million Americans are expected to have diabetes. Okay, so... Diabetes comes in different flavors. There's type one, there's type two, there's gestational, and then there's really a separate disease that's called diabetes insipidus, okay? The word diabetes basically means excessive diuresis, all right? So it means you're peeing a lot, all right? In diabetes mellitus, which is a problem with blood sugar levels, you're going to see hyperglycemia, glucosuria, ketonuria, polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, acidosis, and a fruity odor to the breath. Now, why? Okay, well, let's go back to what's going on. In diabetes mellitus, what's happening is either you're not making insulin because your beta islet cells have been destroyed, or the insulin you're making isn't having an effect because the receptors on the tissues that are the targets have been downregulated. okay? So it's like the insulin shows up, knocks on the door and no one answers. In either case, the blood sugar levels go up. When the blood sugar levels go up, that's gonna pull more fluid from the tissues into the blood. And that's gonna increase the blood volume 
and increase your blood pressure and it's going to cause hypertension. Okay. The other thing that's going to happen is that you're going to see um, sugar in the urine because there's so, so much sugar in the blood that the kidneys can't put it all back. So it ends up in your pee and that's going to pull fluid out of your body. All right. And so you're going to have polyuria, excessive urination, with sugar in your urine, glycosuria, okay, or glucosuria. You're going to be thirsty. Why? Because you're dehydrating, right? And the result is you're going to want to have water all the time, okay? Polyphagia, you're going to be hungry, okay? And then you're going to go into something called ketoacidosis. Now, what is that? Well, if a lot of the cells in your body can't use glucose for energy, what they'll do is they'll go to your body fat instead. And when they break down your body fat without enough sugar in your body, what happens is that you make byproducts that are called ketone bodies, which basically means you're vaporizing your body fat. And so what happens is these ketone bodies end up in your urine, that's ketonuria, and in your breath, that's the fruity odor to your breath because these ketone bodies are chemically related to nail polish remover, which is acetone. So I don't know if you've ever smelled nail polish remover, but that's the smell, okay? Um, in the short term, this is not bad, but it's not great. In the long term, it can kill you, okay? There are a lot of diets out there, for instance, that try to promote ketosis. Okay, by telling you to cut your sugar to almost zero and have a diet of nothing but fat and protein and live off of that, right? And the problem with that is that the ketones are going to cause your body pH to drop and acidosis, if it goes to extremes, can cause death, okay? Because the change in pH is going to affect protein function and is going to affect membrane potential which means you're going to screw up your muscles and your nerves and you're going to screw up really transport in every cell in your body, as well as denature protein, which is bad. Okay. So this is why a lot of times people in the initial stages of type two, they start to lose weight. Okay. And also in type one. And so what they have to do is they have to be very careful about what they eat. Okay. Um, what's the fix? Well, the fix for type one is to give you insulin, right? Either as an injectable or as an inhalant. And that controls your blood sugar. For type two, it's tougher, right? Because in type two, what's happening is that your insulin isn't effective. So what works in type two is diet and exercise and drugs that increase your insulin sensitivity. So the treatments are different in the two types. Now, there's another type called gestational diabetes in which the, the, the placenta soaks up the mother's insulin before it gets to the target. And the result is she gets all of these symptoms, okay? Well, what's the ultimate fix for gestational diabetes? It's to have the baby, okay? Because it's the placenta that's causing the problem. In the meantime, while the mother's blood sugar is rising, what we can do is give insulin. And sometimes that has complications for the mother and the baby later on, okay? And then there's a separate disease that's called diabetes insipidus, okay? It's a totally different animal. Let's write it down. Diabetes insipidus. Do we have the ability to, what's this? Yeah do that. Let's see if this works. Diabetes insipidus. Diabetes insipidus. Ah, it's not going to let me do it. Okay. What happens in diabetes insipidus is that you don't make enough antidiuretic hormone. You don't make enough vasopressin. And what happens as a result is you don't have any water retaining ability or less than you should. 
and that increases your urine output. So you get polyuria and it decreases your blood pressure and your blood volume. But none of these other symptoms show up, right? There's no hyperglycemia, there's no glucosuria, there's no polyphagia, right? There's no acidosis, there's no fruity odor to your breath, but you do have polyuria and polydipsia because you're, you're peeing a lot and so you're thirsty. The lack of any diuretic hormone means that the kidneys can't retain as much sodium, or sorry, can't retain as much water which means that you lose it in the urine and that drops your blood volume and your blood pressure. So what's the fix for diabetes insipidus? It has to give ADH, okay? You give ADH. When you give ADH, you restore the water retaining ability of the kidneys, okay? Believe it or not, my dog has diabetes insipidus, okay? And I have to give him... Um, vasopressin eye drops so he's not peeing all the time so he can hold on to his urine okay. all right now glucagon right that's the hormone that's kicked out when your blood sugar levels fall the alpha cells make that okay it does that by telling the liver to break down glycogen into glucose and kick that into the blood and to convert fat into glucose and kick that into the blood, okay? And the result is that the blood sugar levels go up. Diabetic people with an infection have difficulty controlling their blood sugar levels and they require frequent blood glucose monitoring and additional insulin. Now, what other things can happen in people who have uncontrolled diabetes other than hypertension, okay? and all those other symptoms that we were looking at earlier. Well, if we don't control it, all right, uh, you're gonna have increased likelihood of heart attack and stroke because of the high blood pressure that you're trying to, that you're maintaining, okay? Because the heart has to work harder to pump the blood around the body and the high pressures on the capillaries can rupture them, okay? The other thing that happens from the excess sugar in the blood is lack of blood flow to capillary beds, especially in distal structures like your hands, your fingers, your feet, your retina, okay? So a lot of times what happens in people that are um, not controlling their diabetes well is they have early onset blindness. They'll lose fingers and toes. They may have to have limbs amputated, okay? I had a student in one of my classes who was uh, tending to a, a diabetic patient who had had it for a long time and hadn't controlled it very well. And she took off her sock one day and three of her toes were still inside. And what had happened was that necrosis had set in and those limbs had fallen off. Lack of blood flow means lack of oxygen and nutrients to the tissues, the tissues die <coughs> and then they get infected, okay? Often, amputations of people who have diabetes can be done without anesthetic because the nerve endings have died and so there's no pain associated with it, right? So this is another example of how pain is your friend. Pain is your friend, okay? All right, the gonads. In men, those are the testes and women, those are the ovaries. Both secrete all the sex hormones, testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone, but the testes secrete way more testosterone and the ovaries secrete way more progesterone and estrogen, okay? Um, an interesting little fact about the gonads, all right? And this is aimed at the guys, but the women should listen up too because this, this could affect your boyfriend or your husband, is if they're an athlete, professional athlete, all right, or if they just want to build a lot of bulk, sometimes what they'll do is they'll use illegal compounds called anabolic steroids, which are basically a lot like testosterone. So you get that through a needle, right? You inject it uh, into your glute, right? And then what happens is that that has all the effects of testosterone that, that everybody thinks are cool, right? You get increased muscle mass, increased bone density, increased hematocrit, increased energy, 
right? Increased metabolic rate. Um, and you also have an increase in your libido, your sex drive, okay? The problem with this is that you're interfering with the communication between the hypothalamus and the pituitary and the gonads, okay? So what happens when you're getting your testosterone through a needle is that you're telling those other organs that they don't need to do any work because the levels of testosterone from the needle in your blood are high all the time. You don't make any gonadotropin releasing hormone and you don't make any luteinizing or follicle stimulating hormone. So what happens in guys is that the testes will atrophy. And eventually if you go off the steroid, you may have very little natural testosterone left. And the result then is that your own estrogen and progesterone will begin to produce female secondary sex characteristics, such as loss of body hair, increase in fat de deposition, growth of breasts, okay? All of that because you basically cooked your gonads, okay? Well, not, you haven't cooked them. What you've done is you've, um, you've starved them, okay? Starved them of the command to do anything. And you'll probably be sterile, all right? Um, in women, what happens at menopause is that the estrogen and progesterone production go way down, all right? And that's because it's the follicles in the ovaries that do the hormone secretion. And when the last egg leaves the last ovary, the follicles are all gone. And the result of that is you get a big estrogen and progesterone drop, and that produces conditions familiar to those that have had menopause. And so sometimes what we'll do is hormone replacement therapy, where we'll provide you estrogen and progesterone uh, in order to do things like avoid osteoporosis, maintain thermoregulation, and reduce emotional lability, okay? So both men and women experience a drop in sex hormone production. Women experience an extreme drop after menopause. Men experience a slow decline from adolescence on through death, okay? Uh, by the time a guy is 50, he has uh, less than half the testosterone he had when he was a teenager, okay? And that's gonna affect his muscle mass, his bone density, his crit, all that other stuff, okay? The thymus secretes thymosins, and those are going to control immune functions. Thymosins and thymopoietins help the white blood cells, the lymphocytes do their job, right? The thymus is where our T cells, our T lymphocytes mature and become immunocompetent and then move out to immune organs in the body, like the spleen and the lymph nodes and the tonsils and so on. Your pineal gland secretes a hormone called melatonin, right? And so the way this works is that the melatonin production responds to our light levels, right? So as the sun goes down and it gets dark, the optic nerve sends signals to the hypothalamus, which sends signals back to the pineal gland and the pineal gland increases melatonin production. The melatonin levels as they go up allow the reticular activating system, which is a structure in the brain stem that connects to the thalamus, to basically close the thalamus down so that we become less aware of the stimulus around us and we fall asleep. And then when the sun comes up, the light levels go up, the melatonin levels go down, the reticular activating system then tells the thalamus to open up the gates of perception and we become aware of what's going on around us. This is why Sometimes when people have trouble sleeping, they'll take melatonin, okay? Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, okay? Um, and we should also note that adipose tissue is hormone secreting tissue. It can secrete cytokines and it can secrete other things that basically push you towards type two diabetes, okay? Like cortisol, right? Okay, other hormones. There are organ-specific hormones. The heart, for instance, makes something called atrial natriuretic peptide, which allows us to lose more sodium in our urine and reduce our blood volume and blood pressure, okay? The kidney produces something called renin, 
which helps in controlling our blood pressure through the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism that we'll get into when we get to the urinary system. And then digestive organs produce hormones that control when the pancreas is gonna release its pancreatic juice into the intestine and when the gallbladder is gonna release bile into the intestine and when the stomach is gonna increase production of stomach juice, stomach acid and other components, right? Prostaglandins are secreted by most tissues and control inflammation, okay? As well as pain, as well as smooth muscle contraction, right? Aspirin and ibuprofen block the synthesis of prostaglandins, uh, which enhance the inflammation and reduce our sensitivity to pain, okay? And that's good in terms of feeling better, but that could be bad in terms of treating your condition, right? If we just treat your pain all the time, then we end up sometimes not treating the underlying condition. Okay. <coughs> Excess tissue secretion of cytokine from adipose tissue leads to a condition known as diabetic syndrome. In men, that's abdominal weight, okay? And in women, it's weight in the hips and thighs, all right? And that can predispose you to heart disease, hypertension, um, stroke, heart attack, okay? It can accelerate uh, um, osteoarthritis, and it can contribute to risk of cancer, right? Now, how does this happen? How does all this occur? Well, let's, let's follow the progression here, okay? Uh, if you eat more calories than you burn, you gain weight, okay? And the weight you gain is the bad kind. It's adipose tissue, okay? The extra weight causes increased pressure on the joints, especially the hips, the knees, and the ankles, okay? which grinds away the cartilage in the joints and makes bone on bone inside the joint capsule. And that makes bone spurs and that rattles around inside the joint capsule and it inflames it and that causes arthritis, inflammation of the joint, okay? So that explains joint disease, all right? How about diabetes? Well, same idea here. You eat more calories than you burn, part of those calories are gonna be carbohydrate, right? High carbohydrate levels all the time cause insulin production to be high all the time. When the insulin production is high all the time, what happens is that the levels of insulin receptor in the tissue go down, and so the insulin is less effective, and hence type 2 diabetes, okay? Problems with heart and blood vessels, okay? If you gain weight, what happens is that your blood vessels get longer, and when they get longer, there's more resistance in the cardiovascular system, and the heart has to pump against that harder. And when the heart pumps against that harder, the heart can enlarge, and that's called hypertrophy. And that's bad for the heart, okay? And it also causes the pressure in the system to build because of the heart working harder, in addition to the fact that because of the weight gain and also because of a condition called atherosclerosis, where you get fatty plaque on the walls of the arteries, that the arteries are getting narrower, all right? So the pressure's building, 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 okay? And so that means that if your hypertension uh, gets to a certain level, right, you, you're more likely to blow capillary beds in your heart, cause a heart attack, or blow capillary beds in your brain, cause a stroke, okay? Um, so all of this is, is related, right? And this is why in places like the United States, one of our biggest problems is cardiac or, or cardiovascular disease, right? It's because of our diet, okay? Our diet is very high in calories, but very low in satisfaction, okay? You can eat a lot of high calorie stuff and not feel full. Uh, an example, okay? And I love this. Um, one of my favorite snacks is combos, right? You get them out of the vending machine, you have those pretzels with the filling inside, right? And dietitians recommend that you have 2,000 calories a day to maintain your body weight. You're eating over that and you're not increasing your activity, you're gonna get fat. If you're under that, you're gonna lose weight, okay? 
So you look on the back of a package of combos and you see that a serving of combos is 200 calories. So you think, fine, I can eat this bag of combos and I'm, I'm cool because I'm nowhere near my 2000, right? But what you don't realize is that that 200 calories per serving, the serving isn't the whole bag, right? <laughs> a serving of combos by their definition is two combos, two of those little pretzels, right? So in a snack bag, you've probably got at least half your calories for the day, right? And I don't know about you, but I could wolf down two bags of combos and not feel anywhere near full. And so what does that do? That means I'm in calorie excess, which means I'm going to start gaining weight unless I do a whole lot of exercise, okay? So one of the ways to keep this from happening is to cut your calorie consumption by increasing the amount of protein and the amount of fiber in your diet. So you want to go high protein, high fiber. The fiber has no calorie value for us. The fiber passes through our digestive system untouched and out the other end, but it causes the stomach to stretch so that you feel fuller quicker. Okay. So where do you get a lot of your fiber? Raw fruits and vegetables. Okay. Protein, lean meat. Okay. Um, beans, legumes, stuff like that, right? The reason you eat protein is to make protein. It's not primarily to produce energy, okay? So you eat protein, you break those proteins down into amino acids, and you take those amino acids and you put them back together to make your proteins, right? So proteins are only used for energy in a pinch, like in a starvation situation where you're not taking in any food maybe, and your body starts to break down your own muscle and connective tissue in an effort to keep you alive, right? So if you go high protein, basically you're not gonna impact your calorie intake as much as if you're going high carb, high fat, right? And of course, as you remember probably from the earlier chapters in the book, the calorie champ in your diet is fat, okay? There are more calories per gram of fat than there are in protein or in carbohydrates, right? So high fiber, high protein, high exercise, you're doing yourself a favor, right? You cut down on excess weight and you cut down on all these other associated problems, right? So that's the bottom line, right? To maintain your health. And it's not that hard to do, right? lead off every meal with raw, raw vegetables, okay? Um, a salad with a light dressing maybe, or, you know, something you crunch on like celery or carrots and expand the stomach and you make you feel fuller, okay? Other low calorie condiments include things like salt and vinegar, right? They don't have a lot of calories associated with them. Pickles are low calorie, even though they're high in sodium, okay? And then, High protein, right? Lean meat, fish. That's all going to help in terms of you feeling fuller, but not having as much calorie impact on your body. And then for exercise, what you want to do is make sure that you have an equal mix of, um, of endurance exercise and resistance exercise, right? Endurance exercise is going to be stuff like running, playing basketball, jogging, hiking, okay, jumping jacks, aerobics, if you do that at home. And resistance exercises work with weight, right? But that doesn't have to mean lifting weights, that can mean your own body weight. So things like push ups and sit ups, and dips, right, you can do all those at home with no equipment, and maintain your health, even though you're not a member of a gym or have a whole lot of fancy machinery at home, right? So you can do these things relatively low cost and they're good for you because they're going to make your quality of life better you'll live longer and you'll feel better all the time okay so with that that's really all i've got for today um does anybody have any questions well we got well yeah we can cut it here um does anybody have any questions about anything we've discussed Think it's good? No. Okay. I will send you the links for Mondays and this lecture. There'll be YouTube links. I'll kick it out to all you guys. 
And um, again, if you have any questions outside of class, um, Friday from five to seven by Zoom, okay? And I'll kick a link out to you. And that'll be a recurring thing. And you guys can check in and ask me questions about this course or any other science course that you're taking. And I'll be happy to help you guys out, okay? All right, if we're cool, we will go. All right, thank you, Mr. Converse. Thank you, Have a good weekend. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.